Namaste and greetings. I, Samriti Sharma, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav, Eva Media and Usandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPRI hashtag Web Policy Talk. We are gathered today for a book discussion on politics, ethics, and emotions in New India by Arjun Garavati, published by Routledge. A hearty congratulations to you, sir. This discussion is organized by the IMPRI hashtag Center for Human Dignity and Development, CHDD, as a part of IMPRI hashtag Web Policy Talk book discussion series. I welcome all of you to this enlightening deliberation and thank you for tuning into this discussion. Now, let me introduce the esteemed gathering. Our chair for the session is Ms. Chinki Sinhaji, author, editor, Outlook India. We welcome you, ma'am. We have Dr. Ajay Gudavartiji, author of Politics, Ethics, and Emotions in New India, who is an associate professor, Center for Political Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Welcome, sir. We are fortunate to have for special remarks, Mr. Tushar Gandhiji, President, Mahatma Gandhi <coughs> College. The distinguished panelists for the session are Dr. Hilal Ahmedji, Associate Professor, Center for the Study of Developing Societies, CSDS, New Delhi. Professor Sukumar Mur Murali Dharanji, Associate Professor and Associate Dean, Research, OP Jindal Global University, Sonipat. And Mr. Shubham Sharmaji, PhD scholar, University of Connecticut, USA. Welcome to all. We look forward to learning from our esteemed gathering. Now, without any further ado, let us start with the program. It is my honor and privilege to invite Ms. Chinki Sinhaji to start the program with the chair's opening remarks. Over to you, ma'am. Well, thank you so much. <coughs> so basically, I've uh, known Ajay on you know facebook <laughs> and i've been reading this stuff and it's uh, very delightful and this book actually you know it's damn interesting because uh, this is something that we have uh, been looking at in in terms of uh, uh, shaping the courses as a media organization and he does touch upon the media also in the book which is quite uh, interesting his take and uh, i wanted to uh, basically start with the fact that in january this year we actually brought out an issue which is uh, called uh, politics of feelings uh, with uh, this uh, Vikram Seth poem on the cover. And basically when Ajay makes the point of uh, tackling narrow nationalism with love, I think, uh, which is also what James Baldwin had said, I think uh, we kind of uh, also started with that, uh, with the poem. And uh, I think it's a, it's a very interesting uh, book, uh, uh, particularly for me as a journalist, because uh, it talks about emotions in a post-truth world, which we are witnessing as a media person as to how to understand what's going on. So I'll start with this one quote from Sarah Ahmed, who wrote this uh, book called The Cultural Politics of Emotions. And it goes like this, cultural politics of emotions create others by aligning some bodies with each other inside a community and marginalizing other bodies. The repetition of words elicits an emotional response that only grows as repetition becomes more frequent. And that's exactly what we have been witnessing uh, in what uh, Ajay calls New India. Um, and he, uh, in this book, uh, which uh, he touches upon a lot of interesting things, like, for example, uh, Modi and the silence of uh, the prime minister and the fact that he, uh, you can't put him in any one category. One moment he's a victim, one moment he's uh, like, you know, he's full of rage, one moment he's your protector. Uh, at some, I mean, and the optics are also very, very, very interesting. You see him crying, uh, this whole vulnerability, you know, and then suddenly he becomes really the strong person. So, you know, he's appealing to a lot of people and in, in ways that actually it's very difficult to comprehend uh, uh, for people like us, actually. So uh, the book actually get, does a deep dive into all of these interesting topics like, you know, the Dalit Bahujan identity, for example, the triple talaq and how... Uh, you know, they are consolidating women and creating these fissures, uh, you know, inside these uh, consolidated groups. Uh, he also talks about protest. He talks about um, a lot of uh, things that are very, very interesting uh, for people, uh, you know, who are not able to crack uh, how to do, uh, you know, how to even present certain things in today's uh, 
uh, you know, landscape of, uh, and he, he touches upon post-truth as well, which is a phenomenon that we have been uh, witnessing, and especially uh, <coughs> the people in the media, it's damn difficult for us to dissect certain events. And that's why um, when we uh, started to look at news, which is also, I was just telling Ajay, is mostly manufactured in the newsroom, and uh, to break away from the cycle, and to look at uh, precisely these kinds of things, you know, how emotions appeal and uh, to, to people in changing discourses. And we're not talking about things that really matter, for example, jobs or, for example, welfare. We are only talking about, uh, you know, these, uh, these really like these emotions that uh, kind of like lead us also astray. And I'm not saying that I'm, ag I'm against emotions in politics and it's a very, very valid uh, thing. Uh, and he argues it out in uh, when he talks about uh, the fact that, you know, uh, you know, for example, Ayodhya, you know, this Ram Rajya. And there is this whole politics of nostalgia right there where you invoke something that is so mythical and yet people get on to it. And we have been witnessing this in the family WhatsApp groups with all kinds of uh, things which are not even true, uh, but they're taken to be true and they are actually latching on to some of these emotions that have been latent inside of us and the bjp has mastered this uh, this thing of uh, you know uh, latching on to those kinds of emotions and this othering you know there's, there's this fear uh, there's uh, all kinds of things so for instance he talks about uh, the mobilization for instance against certain arrests for example umar khalid we don't see much uh, you know he talks about um, in this book, let me just, I'll go uh, by uh, each of the topics that he has kind of looked at, and that will make it more interesting. Uh, see, when he talks about this urban Naxal, for instance, that's a term that we have been hearing, and I think most of us here, at least me, would totally qualify for one. Uh, I don't know <laughs> what it means, uh, and how this whole thing of aspiration, which was, uh, you know, he talks about these democratic upsurges where, uh, in the first uh, instance, the Congress tried to do neoliberalism with uh, social inclusion, and the BJP took on from there and kind of started doing the social conservative kind of politics where othering became very important to kind of uh, create a consolidated vote bank, you know, this whole umbrella politics of Hindutva, and, things, and he decodes all of it. So, you know, and then he goes on to all the important topics, like, for example, mob pinching. Now, what was that, for instance, you know? It's, it's, it's rage and it's uh, some kind of justice which, uh, which uh, has been given to people. So we are not feeling angry about these things anymore. We probably think that it is retribution, uh, you know, which is uh, quite okay. So the fact that we have become okay with all of these things, with all these extreme forms of violence is something that needs to be discussed. And I think uh, this is something that, uh, I mean, I, at least uh, media should be looking at, you know, rather than just trying to kind of uh, incite people into, uh, for example, one of the things that we did in the encounter uh, thing was uh, we saw some of the channels actually asking whether encounter should be done. And uh, that's completely like, you know, rule of law. There's no regard for any of this, but it's exactly like, you know, inciting people, uh, catching on to those emotions uh, that have been there. And I'm not saying that people have always loved uh, Muslims or, for instance, Dalits. They've, there, there have always been that thing that <coughs> has become so visible now is something that um, that he looks at. Uh, then he talks about, you know, this majoritarianism. And that's a very interesting uh, topic for me because, uh, and I'll, uh, you know, in journalism, we are told, uh, show, don't tell things like, you know, to explain things. And from my personal experience, there was one person who resigned from Outlook saying that, uh, you know, we are doing the fine combing of majoritarian beliefs and uh, the editor is running a secular agenda. Now, to me, it was completely strange because, you know, what is the agenda here, right? And, uh, you know, it's important when he talks about this majoritarianism and combines it with this economic development and he talks about this aspiration thing that was given to the people and how that turned into anger. Um, and that is the anger that the BJP kind of ch channelized. He talks about 2014 elections, Sabka Saath, Sabka Vikas, and from there, politics of hope goes on to politics of rage. Uh, so all of these things, and and the counter that he kind of presents is that it's not going to come uh, from uh, 
people when they are only challenging these things it also has to be there has to be a narrative that is built around uh, like for example he talks about priyanka gandhi and how priyanka we don't know what priyanka gandhi stands for in that sense we know what the bjp and the rss stand for so there is this whole thing of anchor, anchoring you know and we have seen it in our lives that you always kind of need an anchor and a lot of people are so lost because of this whole confusion that has resulted from neoliberalism this that you know all this religious uh, stuff coming in uh, the fact that uh, you were uh, very comfortable in a system where you know you were uh, the, the, this brahmanical order for instance and then aspiration gave uh, you know the other uh, you know dalits and other caste also this power to kind of lead those kinds of lives and that kind of unsettled certain things which is also by the way happening uh if you if you look at the ground in karnataka for instance you know uh, the if you look at the coastal karnataka for instance where um, the muslims you know i was talking to somebody and they were explaining it to me that uh, there was this delicate balance you know they were the people who were doing the labor stuff and then there were these other classes who were always doing uh, the trading and the fact that uh, the money came in they migrated to dubai and elsewhere and that balance was upset and that created this anger this uh, insecurity and all kinds of things and that was what the bjp kind of made use of in at least coastal karnataka gave people some kind of identity to fight for and uh, and there you go you have all this uh, stuff but the good thing is also that uh, some of these things are being questioned now like you know if you look at uh, the narratives and uh, i mean that's something that we are going to talk about in the next issue is also the 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 what ajay actually also touches upon that uh, you know you take the narrative out of the hindutva situation and create another narrative it will take time but i think it can be done and uh, he talks about that in the book as well uh, in the third section of the book he talks about ethical emotions and uh, he talks about uh, how to fight hindutva which is damn interesting uh, because that's something uh, we have not been able to figure out i mean the fact that what is hindutva and what does it mean in different different places for instance i am from bihar so the whole context of even uh, ram you know that whole ayodhya movement changes you know uh, depending on the location that you are in for instance in the south you don't have that emotion so how are they trying to uh, kind of uh, use this uh, religion identity and uh, you know this whole thing of mythical uh, you know the attachment that you form for mythical characters and turning it into history by the way it's very dangerous um, uh, to uh, to kind of build this hindu rashtra whatever that is i don't know what they've never kind of uh, talked about what this hindu rashtra will mean for people like us um, especially in context of this also i would like to say that most of these media organizations are also governed i mean are also the composition of people who are editors who are journalists are mostly kavarnas you know like people who come from upper classes upper caste uh, they have zero experience or zero uh, you know I, i i don't know if i should use the word empathy uh, that's not enough uh, but uh, not for the others we don't un- they don't understand i mean we don't understand either so for instance uh, even for women we don't understand and and some of the most important issues of our times are actually not being covered by media because of the fact that uh, there is not enough representation there's not enough diversity which is the problem in india as well so this narrative of hindutva will not be challenged uh, because the composition is such and um, then you have uh, he talks about modernity and the right which is also a very very interesting chapter as to how people have always perceived the right as very traditional uh, but uh, it's not actually and uh, he starts in his intro with a very interesting thing which the left liberals kind of dismissed when this whole thali bajao and uh, diya jalao thing happened during the covid times you know right when uh, uh, you know the the lockdown was announced and it was very abrupt when the lockdown was announced and people just went in for this jingoistic uh, what we call left liberals whoever identifies as one uh, and we kind of made fun at it of of all of this kind of stuff that was happening but people believed in it and that's what we failed to kind of see and uh, people completely forgot about the fact that there were thousands and thousands of migrant laborers on the streets without food without anything and a prime minister comes and says stay home not even like completely disregarding the fact that there are many people who probably have no homes here it this is not italy or this is not america but the fact that with all this rhetoric and all these optics 
we managed to kind of pull it off and people like i was in bihar for the elections afterwards uh, the first elections that happened in 2020 uh, people were still ready to vote for modi and uh, kind of uh, i don't know how he created this thing but people said that he's not at fault and uh, he did the best he could and there was a lot of these uh, monkey bath and all these things involved and it is very interesting that ajay talks about it because for the longest time uh left liberals have kind of made fun of these things and kind of looked down upon this but uh, it's something very interesting to look at because people do believe in it and we cannot dismiss uh people and their beliefs in that sense and try and understand it properly then he talks about kashmir before and after abrogation which is also very very interesting because kashmir you know there if i look at kashmir i only see silence there is nothing coming out of kashmir as of now it's like a black hole people cannot talk people don't uh, want to be uh, seen or heard uh, it's just complete whatever they're very very afraid and then he talks about the kashmiri uh, pundits which is very interesting in the wake of the things that have been happening like you had this vivek agnihotri's uh, strange film uh, kashmir files uh, and uh, he talks about the fact that whether it is legitimate anger or is it hatred and that's a very interesting question that he poses because that's something to think about you know this whole thing of retributive justice what people think it is so completely and the combination of uh, you know judiciary and cbi and all these institutions that are that they have combined in order to present something for instance uh, he talks about sabri mala and the bjp and he talks about this whole thing of article 25 trumping article 14 and uh, so it's not really without thought that they are doing this and it's it's quite interesting that uh, you know the book touches upon the topics that are very very uh, interesting in the wake of the elections that are coming next year right like so the the the, the ram temple which has been there and which we think is their final whatever card uh, will be uh, you know it's all all based on emotions basically then he talks about this whole thing of reconciliating india and regionalizing democracy which is very interesting touches upon this whole thing of federalism he talks about you know <clears throat> different political leaders uh, how they have uh, been seeing it and then uh, will fi- india finally become a hindu rashtra is a very interesting uh, chapter at the end because that's the question that we have been confronted with uh, people who actually uh, believe that uh, you know we were uh, that we came we come from a secular country now that whole word secular i mean in my lifetime which is like 43 years has become such a bad word and you are just thinking what the hell just happened right <laughs> like how why am i being cast in such a negative thing or for just being secular so and you can't really argue if you don't understand these kinds of complexities in in people i mean it's easy to dismiss somebody who calls you secular which we have been doing but why they are dismissing you as secular is something that kind of you need to look at in the context of the fact that you know there are all these other forces emotional uh, you know uh, things that are being fed to the people and they are also like kind of latching i mean i see my own family and they are swearing by all of this they are saying that no taj mahal was this one you know and this whole temple reconstruction for instance you know how do you argue like i asked my you know i tell you a simple like it, it's funny they said musliman log bahut bahut bacche paida kar rahe hain then i said how do you know he's like you don't ask elders these kinds of questions and you know ye sab to bahut saal se ho raha hai now in this cover that we are coming out with now like 14% how can you take over how can they take over this entire like this whole fear psychosis that they have created that musliman log take over kar lenge you know and this country doesn't belong to them now if you look at in my life span you know when i was growing up it was just there you know muslim hindu lived together it was not <coughs> that was the case there now it seems that we are patronizing muslims you know in the sense that if we are letting them live they must live uh, because we are and, and they should be grateful that we are there and they should uh, observe certain things so so i feel that this book is a must Uh, read and this is not a new thing a lot of people have talked about emotions in the past and the place of emotions in politics which was always dismissed and he talks about it that the previous century was the age of was the era of revolutions and this is the era of emotions especially in a post truth world where media is a culprit and has been kind of doing all this nonsense and not really focusing on things that should be uh, focused on uh, he brings out these these arguments and in a very lucid way and that 
itself, you know, because these case studies are all very, very, like he talks about protests, the Shaheen Bagh movement, for instance, the JNU violence, you know, and why were we not angry? And that's something very interesting to uh, kind of figure. Um, so I feel that uh, for us, I mean, as, as media people, this book is damn interesting. And uh, it gives us some insight into how to think about things. And, you know, when we go and cover elections, how to kind of look at these narratives, because we have only been covering who, what, when, why, uh, which is called a typical news pyramid. And uh, uh, this gives us a lot of uh, food for thought. Uh, when we look at, uh, you know, election campaigns, the manifestos and what they're talking about, uh, for instance, Love Jihad, uh, for instance. Uh, and uh, I mean, I would also say that he touches upon politics of love and hope. And I think uh, uh, that's also very important because we did see some hope in Bihar in 2020 when they talked about unemployment and uh, 10 lakh jobs, uh, as opposed to what they had been talking about, which is the Mandal politics uh, so far. And CPIML uh, kept aside their agenda of land reforms and came together with RJD after many, many years, after many years, first time, probably like after Chandrasekhar's uh, this thing. And uh, that he touches upon in this book, which we call imperfect solidarities. And I think uh, that is a, a, a very interesting uh, uh, also thing to look at, that how people can come together to, to challenge these dominant narratives. And uh, yeah, so it, it, it gives us hope and it gives us uh, a lot of uh, you know points to think about, and maybe maybe our coverage will uh, uh, become better because I also feel that imperfect solidarities are a must in journalism. Academics can come and join hands, and artists, fiction writers, poets, everybody should join hands to kind of uh, you know present the truth because that's become so rare now. Facts have been pushed aside, and there are all these narratives that are emerging. Uh, we have seen it in Hathras, we have seen it in Ayodhya, we have seen it elsewhere, everywhere, in fact. And um, so, yeah, so I'm going to actually tell everyone in the office to read this book and kind of open their <laughs> minds to, uh, uh, you know, and, and not dismiss emotions because forever, because, because this hyper rationalist liberal thing of dismissing emotions is actually not a very good thing. I mean, I think, uh, and, and that's why we have these, uh, these problems now. We don't know what to make of the current situation, how to decode, how to challenge, how to even dissect it. And I think that's very important. So yeah, so I just wanted to thank you for writing this book. Uh, it's, it's a great read. Thank you. Thanks, Shinky. I think who would I think because Shinky, you are also the chair, so I think you will have to take over and invite <laughs> the, the next speakers. <laughs> yes. so do, they, can do, it. do we just start or do we need an invitation? Shinky, uh, you would perhaps invite or Arjun, do you want to? Samriti, you can invite for special remarks to share. Yeah. Yes, sir. I would like to go ahead and and invite. Um, Mr. Tushar Gandhi for his remarks. Over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, I must in the beginning confess that uh, because of certain uh, recent developments, I really haven't been able to read the book in uh, detail. All I managed to do was a skim over uh, the thing. What fascinated me was the uh, title of the book. Uh, because uh, when I read that uh, the title of the book, I the first question that came to my mind is: Is this uh, fiction or non-fiction? Because uh, the two qualities that uh, the title of the book uh, alludes to seem to be imaginary in uh, New India, because uh, ethics has long been thrown out of the window, and uh, in New India, emotions are uh, just very blatantly manipulated and uh, abused. And so uh, the title is very provocative uh, in the sense that uh, in its absence in uh, the new India that we see. Uh, the thing is that I feel that, you know, uh, we have uh, intellectualized all these things to a great extent. Of course, there is a need for the academic uh, analysis of all these phenomena uh, to happen, but also the fact that uh, 
in the intellectual pursuit, we have somehow overlooked the progressive manipulation of our polity and society that has been uh, carried out very systematically by the Sanghis right from the inception of this country. They haven't, it's not as if it's in the past three or four decades. Uh, in the past three or four decades, they've just accelerated the pace. But hate has been the undercurrent of Indian uh, uh, public discourse uh, almost from the time uh, of uh, independence because initially they uh, campaigned about partition and uh, justified Bapu's murder on the basis of the partition tragedy and uh, the trauma of partition. And every trauma that this country has undergone subsequently has either been manipulated on that or as a progression of that uh, politics of hate to become uh, mainstream. And mm. I think that emotions in politics in today's time, especially in, uh, uh, I won't call it post-truth time, but post-Modi time, definitely, emotions has become a very dangerous thing. And uh, because we see how cleverly Modi and his cohorts uh, manipulate those emotions to for their own uh, uh, political gains from uh, uh, you know, uh, Samshan uh, and Dehra or Kabrastan me diya and hum wo char unke pachis and all those rhetorics that started from Gujarat and now have become mainstream in India. You see that steady acceleration of the acceptance of hate as a legitimate public discourse. We intellectualize it by saying public discourse, but now it's almost become like a cacophony. Uh, it's a shouting match. It's a screaming match. It's often hysterical. If you just look at the election campaigns, uh, it feels like, you know, the old time Hindi courtroom melodramas where uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the lawyers would stand up and shout themselves hoarse, and the lawyer who shouted the loudest was shown to be the guy who eventually won the case. That has now become this acceptable uh, norm in public discourse. Quiet, rational uh, uh, talk is dismissed as weakness these days, and uh, bombastic rhetoric is become. And that is where the Thali Bajau thing became such a big. Uh, victory uh, for uh, Modi because the cacophony that we created with that Thali Bajau uh, completely drowned out the pleas for help of the migrant workers who were completely left uh, without any uh, support in a place that suddenly they discovered they were alien. Uh, and, and so at every stage, we have allowed him to steal a march over us. And so this book is a very important uh, milestone in which it actually shows us where we have gone wrong, where we have lost out to this, uh, this entire uh, success of hate, of lies, and of, you know, I won't call it post-truth because this is blatant lies that are being uh, so wonderfully passed off. The, the triumph of Modi is in his ability to fool everybody all the time. Ever since uh, he has come uh, into power in Gujarat to uh, today, and he's going to continue that to 2024 also, where uh, he sees as the watershed where he will surpass uh, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru's record, which is his objective, because that he will take as a license to then completely change India as we have always thought of. He's also the progression from Agnihotri branding everybody as urban Naxals to Modi branding people like us as Andolan GBs. That's also a sinister campaign. You know, the mm -hmm. terms may be different, but the progression towards marginalizing and demonizing the opposition is a very scientific study uh, methodology that they have uh, uh, used and all this has to be taken care of. Uh, the only way to counter 
this uh, campaign of hate and uh, I also don't believe that this is majoritarianism. We've long back past that point of majoritarian uh, democracy. We've now descended into a mobocracy where mobs decide what is right and what is wrong. If you look at the bulldozer politics and its acceptance all over India, it is it is the uh, uh, my, uh, uh, you know the right of the mighty that is being showcased over there. The encounter thing, they're very clear, cleverly sort of, uh, you know, uh, further uh, identified it as uh, the, uh, these are all outlaws. These are all uh, 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 criminals uh, hiding the fact that most of them are Muslims and uh, uh, successfully gotten away with. Every crime that they have committed, they have managed to, make it justifiable amongst the masses. And this is because they have completely subjugated democracy to the rule of a mob and uh, are getting away with all of it. It's just not majoritarianism because there is a counter to majoritarian. There is a rational to the majoritarian thing. Here it is brute, the, the very apt saying in Hindi, jiski lati uski bhais. The buffalo is really being taken over by the guy who wields the mace kind of thing. Bajrang Bali in Karnataka is again the same uh, rhetoric about uh, might is right uh, being uh, acceptable in India. If you look at uh, the campaign of hate, if you look at the 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 fear that has been instilled in the Muslims and the minorities. We talk about Muslims, but look what is being done with the Christians indirectly. By targeting Muslims and then subjectively and uh, in, in pockets targeting Christians, the message that is going out to Christians while the prime minister goes and needs some, uh, uh, you know, acceptable uh, uh, bishops and things in Kerala, in Chhattisgarh and in Mizoram, Christians are being targeted. All over the north, churches are being targeted. The message is very systematically being sent out into this new India where hate is the religion. The only way we will be able to counter Hindutva politics is to make people aware that the other name, the real name of Hindutva is hate. There is no two ways about it. There is no religion in it. It is a religion of fear. It is the practice of hate. And we must be, the question must be put whether we want to be known as the people who hate in the future. Because that is what is happening in India today. That is what they have manipulated us into being. And so this book is like the sounding of the alarm, showing us the dangers. But the translation into a methodology to extract the venom that has been so cleverly instilled in our society has yet to be found. And that can only happen if we bring back collective democracy into our practices, because today we are accepting an authoritarian form of democracy and allowing the Modi Shah combined or the yogi uh, 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 rule in UP to get away with practicing authoritarianism under the guise of democracy. And so, Instead of talking about majoritarianism and things, the time has come to brand their practices as dictatorial and authori uh, authoritarian. And only then can maybe we be able to instill life or resuscitate the completely murdered conscience of the collective Indians today. Because our conscience has been massacre and we have allowed that to happen now we have to find a way 
to bring back that sanjeevani jadi buti to rekindle life into our consciousness and that can only happen if ethics become important to us and so this book can provide that understanding of these values and the lack the danger of the lack of those values in our public life and for that uh, i thank you uh, professor gudavarti and uh, uh, just like uh, chinki me too we have only met on facebook so it's high time that we meet in person thank you so very much thanks thanks tushar thanks so much thank you sir thank you so much for your thought provoking and uh, thought provoking remarks and i would like to move ahead and invite uh, mr shubham sharma for his yes um Mr. Sharma. Yeah, 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 yeah. Am I audible now? Yes, you are. All right. So uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, would like to thank uh, Jay and uh, Impri, uh, the ones who had organized it, for having this discussion on this very important book. Uh, well, I've just reviewed the book, so and uh, I know what is there in it thoroughly. And there is much that I agree with, and I much there is that, that I disagree with. I come from a radical Marxist tradition, materialist tradition. For so dealing with emotions as a core topic of the book was a bit, too, a bit uh, challenging, but humbling at the same time. It was challenging because it took me some time. That okay, how do we translate this into policy or politics, for that matter? For which uh, I got answers later on. but uh, i was humbled because uh, there is no political economy so to speak which differentiates the hindutva project from bourgeois democracy in general in india and this is what this is precisely what distinguishes uh, uh, 20th century fascism from what hindutva is today uh, ajay starts his book by saying that if 20th century following hobbes law it was an age of revolution it was also an age of counter revolution we saw hitler fascism fascism mussolini and all the rest of it and then we saw stalin and then uh, the chinese revolution going out of hand but uh, today he says that is the age of emotion and i would add it's not just emotion it is unreason uh, if you look around uh, how hindutva operates i mean i come from west bengal that's my home state uh, and i come from the city where uh, the bjp won the first uh, uh, parliamentary election and it was a city which has a population of say 15% muslims round about 15 to 17 i don't know the exact demography but this this would be the exact number uh it was a city which uh, was ruled by the left before the left by the congress as soon as the bjp came in i mean this was not when they uh, had power in the state i mean by just one mp they made sure that the city saw two communal rights you see and those communal rights were around issues uh, which were simply not the point of discussion in the city you know one was about having a a place which was mm-hmm. uh, owned by a muslim man where a durga puja used to happen every year under a makeshift gazebo but that became an issue when people fought over it right so what is it that makes the bjp so formidable i mean what is it that makes it uh, so to speak so undefeatable it is their simple micro politics of fate now micro politics of fate you know hindu muslim issue this communalism has been uh, raking india for almost a century or more I, everybody thought with the partition of india the so called muslim question would be solved forever unfortunately this is not to be you know why was it not to be uh, despite uh, the government being run by congress and coalitions why did the rss survive right and one should keep in mind that the rss project unlike uh, any other right wing project in the world is a century old project there is no right wing government if right wing is a was is a spectrum you know you would see you wouldn't see any movement in the world that is as old as the rss it survived the killing of gandhi it survived the emergency and this is the only right wing group in the world and for that matter a, a political party in india political consolidation india which has not seen which has not seen a single break the communist movement broke up into splinters right the congress broke up right regional parties broke up the janata dal broke up this is a party this is a political consolidation organization which has not suffered a break so that shows 
how ideologically and politically formidable they are for the past one century. And what, what is allowing them to thrive? I mean, this is the question which my generation is asking. 2002, Modi massacres almost 3,000 Muslims in Gujarat, right? Amit Shah has cases against him. UPA comes in for two terms, right? None of them are jailed. No action taken against them. The same goes for the Ayodhya uh, destruction. We had a non-BJP government in UP twice, one and, once under the SP and then the BSP. Nothing came out of it. Interestingly, I was reading uh, Chetan Bhatt's book, right? He's an LSE anthropologist. Uh, when Gandhi was killed, you know, I think it was a month or two later that Golwalkar wrote a letter to Jawaharlal Nehru. And it was, uh, I mean, the state has not had not really gone after the RSS the way it should have. It was just banned in the first place. And there were, of course, you know, people were heaping of opium for what they have done, or at least they were, they were part of this whole uh, scheme to kill Gandhi. He writes that in the letter that he writes to Nehru, he says that Panditji, uh, our role, I won't quote verbatim, but this is what it was, that our role and our political program is not against you. It is against the communists, right? The whole letter, the whole letter said that, okay, it is not against this new regime that has come in power after a long and arduous anti-colonial nationalism. It is the communist that we want to defeat, right? I don't know what happened, right? What Nehru responded uh, to Golwalkar, I would have to check into the archives. But the ban was uh, lifted sometimes later, you know, on the insistence of the Congress, right? And they've been functioning since then. Despite the Jeevan Lal Kapoor Commission saying, I mean, indicting and saying things about the RSS that they had distributed sweets when Gandhi was dead, right? There has, I mean, they have survived all this, you see. So this is the greatest challenge of our generation that how to stop it. And they and their politics, as I said before, that you know, there is no political economy, so to speak, behind the Hindutva project. Yes, you can speak of cronyism, crony capitalism. The Raphael deal was one of the biggest examples where in the earlier deal, Congress was uh, uh, looking for HAL, the Hindustan uh, Aeronautics Limited, to be the lead integrator. But here, Ambani was given the project. Later on, we see uh, Adani uh, having a lion's share of Indian public sector utilities, which were declared to be sick. But there is the overarching cronyism had existed before also. So what is it that makes it so formidable? And especially, I mean, after the 2019 elections, it has been seen that you know, most of the plebeian masses, you know, who were part of what Jaffalo called the silent revolution, I mean, they have become violent. You see. What is the answer to this conundrum? Uh, it is purely, purely hate politics, and that has very, very micro sociological roots. I think this is where uh, Ajay's importance, I mean, the importance of the book comes in uh, more than anything else. Now, you see, uh, uh, Badri Narayan has written about it that how icons who are forgotten within their own communities, like Suhal Dev and Nantha Chamar, I mean, they've been brought out. Not just as uh, not just as you know leaders of the community, but you know leaders against the Muslim or the Turk invasion of India. The historical veracity, of course, it is false, right? But still, it is getting takers, you know. So this is where uh, we can uh, we will, I mean, as a political strategy program, have to pitch some form of you know, uh, you know so we have to pick up history histories of compassion between the two communities, of which there is no dearth in India. There's absolute no dearth of such compassion in India. I mean, all the leaders, I mean, if you read uh, Subhash Chandra Bose in the original, uh, he was countering the Hindu, Hindu Mahasabha in Bengal by writing histories that how Siraj Dola's general was a Hindu, right? So these were, I mean, these tactics have been going on for a long time, but politically we need to uh, ratchet up on it, right? So that they don't steal a march over us. But uh, which political political party will be in a position to do it? What program would it offer? As Ajay talks in his book, that you know a strong welfare program needs to be taken up by the opposition, which is not in the offing, unfortunately. Uh, I mean, I had uh, in one conversation uh, with Ajay himself. I mean, I told that you know the opposition can give a slogan that "Kav se leke cancer, sarkar ki hogi zimmedari." Given what uh, had happened in the aftermath of the COVID pandemic. But, uh, you know, no political party is ready to give uh, a solid program, so to speak, to the people of India, which they desperately need. And every time, you know, you know, the Modi media, the laptop journalists, they look at Modi versus who? Modi versus whom? There's no answer, unfortunately. But yes, the opposition should come and say that, you know, we all know that Nandri Modi is, is a fearful man. He's fearful of debates, he's fearful of questions. Okay, just say, if, if Modi is ready, I mean, every political party should pitch it that, okay, be it Rahul Gandhi, be it Sitara, be it Shuri, you know, pick, take your pick. Okay, have a presidential debate the way it happens in the US. 
would modi be up for it of course not right this could be one way how we can you know you know uh, destroy the halo around him you know and even ajay have mentioned in his book that you know, that despite uh, modi uh, wearing a 10 lakh rupee suit and you know maybach sunglasses when he unders all this right by sitting in a cave and then he comes back and uh, sits in a new brand new car which is worth millions people say okay he deserves it but in case of rahul gandhi when he wears a t-shirt you see which is apparently worth 40 40000 the social the social media goes after him you see but why is why is there no sympathy for any political leader in india as opposed to modi you know why is that halo around him because that halo has been artificially constructed and in the making for the past two decades or more despite uh, uh, modi having blood on his hands and then the so called secular opposition will have to take some blame or perhaps a lot of blame uh, uh, in not able to you know counter the hegemony of the rss socially or politically the karnataka elections are the best example the congress had rightly i suppose that had mentioned that they would ban the pfi and the bajrang dal right but once it was out in public once it was out in public they sort of you know rescinded from what they were doing you know now this is unacceptable you know if you i, I mean this was not the case in the, the muslims didn't come over and say okay why are you banning the pfi I mean, it was not a huge majority of Hindus who okay, were saying don't ban the Bajrang Dal. It was these uh, largely you know, members and affiliates of these rowdy association called the Bajrang Dal, which has a long history, you know, a long and disgraceful history of beating up people, creating ruckus, who were, you know, uh, coming on the streets against this proposal. Why did the Congress go back on this? Why did D K Shiv Kumar start visiting on one temples? Now, this is the exact problem which the opposition needs to create. If you want to take on the beast, okay, take them by its horns. Right? There cannot be any cherry picking because they do to you things which are unimaginable. Look what happened to Rahul Gandhi. I happen to see the entire High Court proceedings, right? The three R proceedings. You know, the, Justice Parikshit was uh, part of it. I mean, by the very body language, I understood that he is not getting an interim bail whatsoever. So the you know the the opposition has to uh, bite the BJP harder on welfareism number one. secondly counter its hate agenda which is overarching so to speak from micro levels of hate micro histories of hate micro sociology of hate a long an arduous struggle is required you see bottom up that should be bottom up uh, and then of course modi should be uh, pressured from all directions so to speak you know that okay modi versus who let's have a presidential style debate modi versus rahul gandhi let's have a debate on i mean the way it happens in the us he will not be up for it you know this is how uh, this beast needs to be brought down you see or else uh, if the third term comes in i've been thinking of writing a piece lately that it might just be the coming of the third reich in india in some form or the other so with this i think uh, uh, the panelists have already spoken the first person to speak mr shinki has already summarized the book there isn't much to say but yes uh, ajay's contributions uh, should be read uh, especially by the leaders of the political party to understand uh, why so to speak why this beast of hindutva is hydra headed beast it never it never dies you know do they have weaker weapons were their uh, hatchets too uh, uh, too weak to cut it through this has to be deeper i think for this the book will play a, a very good role in terms of educating and uh, you know revealing some of uh, the aspects which are not which are you know some things like emotion which are not part of you know the political discourse and even academically i mean i was never taught despite being a student of social science a course on political emotions you know so i think that gap has been fulfilled and i'm glad that it is from india i'm sure there is literature outside i think this attempt has to be lauded and has to be uh, has to be read thoroughly so with this i think i would uh, give rest to my speech and uh, yeah i look forward um thank you shubham ji for your wonderful remarks uh i would now like to invite dr hilal ahmed ji please over over to you sir yeah uh thank you very much uh i'm pray for giving me this opportunity and uh, giving me this opportunity to also to read this wonderful book ajay i must congratulate ajay for uh, writing this now um mm, i'm not going to make any speech uh as an academic this is not my duty and as a panelist uh it would be uh my role to talk about 
what is written inside the book uh, because i think it is this is very important uh, we know what is happening in the country so therefore there is no need to uh, revisit uh, that uh, empirical uh, uh, reality again because ajay's book has captured it in an analytical language and therefore it is very important for all of us to try to understand the analytical ways in which he is responding to the crisis which we are observing at the moment uh i would like to make three broad comments and these three broad comments are revolving around what ajay has written in the book uh my first comment is uh, basically about the framework he is offering uh i really like the way in which the idea of new india is linked to something called emotions uh if we read the book we also find that this is the book which is actually in a way a sequel a sequel uh, to his previous work and here this idea of new india is actually taken as a reference point a reference point to make sense not barely the uh, in the, the rhetoric of the academic rhetoric of populism but try to understand the ways in which new india can be understood by uh, us so that is one important conceptual move which ajay takes now the second thing which he does and very intentionally uh, is basically you know making a distinction which is uh, in in which is there very briefly but in a very powerful way a distinction between ethics and morality now this is very important because we use ethics and morality inter interchange now ajay spoke tells us that we have to make a distinction and try to locate uh, rss's politics in these in this distinction this is my, in my view Uh, is the most creative way to make sense of rss at the moment this distinction because usually we do not ask this question which ajay is asking so i am really glad that this framing of the question is done uh, in a very creative way so that's the first uh, remark which i would like to make now this is an unusual book this is unusual and that makes it extraordinary why this is unusual uh, because of its methodology and this is my second point methodologically uh, ajay is and he's very honest we all know his honesty as an author and then as as a teacher now as an author he clarifies that these are the basic comments which he has written in uh, various uh, web portals newspaper etc and then and this is a very creative way again uh, a very creative methodological point why because initially because many of these things which ajay has put together in a form of a book i have read them already and i find that the the comment which he makes uh, in his public writing are actually addressed to the common sense of the public or the common wisdom which we call public wisdom but he does not stop there he encourages us to actually also polish them polish the main argument the argument remains the same but the audience changes at the second level and that's the second level this is the second important methodological moves which he evokes and here uh, is the this is an important uh, contribution he raises a very a very remarkably uh, you know um, serious theoretical questions about politics and democracy so first we have a reflection on the issues which we are encountering and second he then uh, in the book tries to engage with this issue with the existing theoretical literature now this engagement and this is the third aspect of his methodology this engagement is crucial because this engagement is not to prove that someone said something Uh, is justifiable here he is also trying to uh, you know taking the empirical reality as a way to engage with a theoretical formulation so you can you encounter various kind of theoretical formation in the book which are actually tested in a creative way with 
uh, Ajay's uh, with Ajay's analysis. So that gives that empowers Ajay to say something uh, very substantial analytically. This is I really really like this method of engaging public and at the same time raising certain theoretical issues at the higher level is extraordinary and unusual which i and that's why i call it an unusual method of logic so that's my second comment but ajit does not stop here and that's the third point the third remark which i would like to make and this is the remark which actually uh, we both uh, ajay and i we share many things uh, intellectually and politically so that's why we are coming from the same tradition and here ajay uh, actually teaches us something very uh, remarkable he says that the theoretical and the political the interaction between theoretical and uh, political must be thought of and that's the crux of his argument when he is making a comment about muslim politics when he is making comment about dalit bahujan politics when he is talking about cultural revolution a new cultural revolution of the left he is engaging with the political uh, while while locating himself in the realm of uh, intellectual this is what i call the intellectual politics and uh, i can clearly see uh, a few very interesting aspect of this intellectual politics in ajay's work the first aspect is what i called the process of research so uh, we find because it's an intellectual politics it's not a politics that you know ajay is or uh, the book is not proposing us to create new uh, new manifesto for a new new political party or new constitution we have to understand this nuances the nuanced that this is actually an intellectual point intellectual project which has its own specific politics so what is the nature of that specific politics this book uh, in my view there, there can be three very interesting uh, issues which he talks about uh, which in my view not uh, rather explicitly but these things are implicit the ways in which the arguments are made especially in the last part of the book the first is the process of research so he's he honestly throughout the book you find that the process of research is explicitly explained that is called uh, that he is inviting the reader to understand the ways in which he is moving uh, in this exploration so that's the process of research is explicitly explained second and very crucial and uh, i do not subscribe to uh, my other co-panelist with this that i do not find that ajay is not making any distance from uh, the communities people and the issues he is working on we find a very intelligent ways in which ajay as a researcher is distancing distancing himself from the issues on which he is working so that's also make his positioning as an intellectual uh, his his form of intellectual politics more convincing and acceptable the third thing is and that's why uh we have to you know actually learn this aspect very carefully uh the, the tentativeness of the argument he's not saying you know look at the last part which is you know obviously in in my view there could be uh you know the title is uh, not very appropriate when he's talking about how could be it uh, in the white sector i think that there could be some other uh, more meaningful title here he is proposing an argument a template in which uh, we can try to uh, it it is actually a template by which a new form of coalition in terms of politics could be worked out i think uh, and that is not to defend him because the critique which we observe in the book is not and it should not be reduced entirely to the bjp or hindutva it is a critique of political class and therefore we have to read this book in as a critique of the existing political class and its failure to produce a narrative which uh, which is very different from the majoritarian wisdom which is actually uh, you know we encounter in our everyday life so these are the three broad comments which i would like to make uh, a few a uh, two very quick uh, limitations which i think are important and i hope that Uh, and these are not criticism i would say uh, because uh, uh, we are uh, co traveler in this journey so we read each, each other's work and uh, we make criticism uh, uh, quite often uh, one thing which i wanted ajay to 
uh, have it in the book. Uh, he talks about New India, uh, and I think uh, two or three times he also talks about it's a doctrine. Uh, so, but he does not look at the structural aspect of New India. Uh, in what ways this idea of New India uh, actually become a doctrine? It was passed by. Uh, it was actually passed as a resolution by BJP. Uh, it is also Niti Ayo, which has got a uh, vision document called New India, which I think you also mentioned. But there is a need to look at this idea of New India, the ways in which this New India uh, is different from the old India is structurally. So that is something which uh, I hope that uh, Ajay will certainly come up uh, in his future writing. Uh, the second thing is about, as I said, that the criticism of political, obviously, when we criticize political class, the focus would be on the dominant uh, party, and it's, just, it's natural. Uh, but the criticism of the political class uh, need to be more sharpened, uh, which Ajay can actually do uh, in his future writing. Uh, for instance, it is very, uh, it is actually a common sense to use the term narrative. Uh, the dominant narrative, etc. But if we uh, look at the uh, the history of post-colonial Indian politics, we find that there are three or four dom. There, there is always a dominant narrative, and the entire political class follows that dominant narrative in such a way that they cannot deviate from it. Ajay's book also makes that point, but rather implicitly. Uh, the manner in which the opposition parties are using Hindutva or appropriating Hindutva for their own sake. Uh, a slight remark to the previous uh, panelist that it is not true that there was not a rupture because it is now a common sense to assume that uh, RSS, uh, Bajrang Dal, the, the, the configuration we call uh, Sangh Parivar, there is no contestation uh, among them. This is not true. Uh, because remember one thing that uh, 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 Janasang and Hindu Mahasabha, they fought three elections against each other in 1951 to 57 in 1962. And now after 1962, uh, Hindu Mahasabha became almost redundant and uh, meaningless. That's why Janasang survived one. Second is that the, de the debate between uh, the conflict between Jansang and RSS has always been a serious uh, political consideration. And that's why uh, someone like Balraj Madhok uh, would criticize the India Lopadhyay, would also criticize Atal Bihari Vajpayee. So the, these contestation must take into consideration while looking at the success story because I don't and remember one thing that in the 50s and 60s and even 70s uh, you know uh, Hindu rightists were the marginal force of Indian politics they were not the dominant one so we should not actually exaggerate their 100 year story uh, and we, we have to look at me because they were they were a non-entity goal worker was not a serious you know uh, what not a serious thinker Goldworker was not at all a political mobilizer. He was actually a failure. And I can tell you, Vishwanath Tripathi, he was the professor of uh, uh, Hindi uh, in Delhi University. He was an RSS person, close associate of uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee. He moved out, moved out of RSS, joined Communist Party, he spent entire life in communist uh, circles. So therefore, I think we need to also understand this contestation. Uh, I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, your words were captivating, and thank you so much for the valuable perspective you brought to the table. Um, Tushar, sir? I think sir raised his hand. Yeah. I, I just wanted to uh, come in over here and uh, contest uh, this uh, statement. Uh, you know, this academic study of uh, politics is dangerous because uh, by giving these examples of the distant past, we seem to be negating the true reality of our present. And that leads to further confusion. So I, I'm sorry to just butt in, but I thought that I should come in and talk about this because if we go into the past, there'll be many examples that we can give to counter 
what the present reality is but that doesn't change our present and how dangerously it is going to affect our future and so i think this comparing and giving examples from the 50s and 60s should now stop because the 50s and 60s have been made redundant in new india now can i come in yeah tushar ji uh i actually try to respond to a question that uh, you know this story of uh, rss is unbroken and uh, they did not suffer any break or any split i just wanted to explain uh, <clears throat> i do agree with the fact that there is no need to go back to the past and since we are we have been discussing ajay's book which is very much contemporary which is very much concerned with the contemporary so therefore we have to focus it but having said that we have to make a distinction between two things uh, historicization and historical reduction what i did in my comment it's called historicization uh, i try to locate ajay's argument in the larger perspective and this is my job by the way uh, i am not i'm not an activist and i respect uh, you and others Uh, who are coming from very different background but as a professional academic this is my duty to actually place these things in a larger perspective thank you dr ajay uh, over to you sir okay so let me begin by i'm i'm audible samriddhi yes yes sir clearly audible okay so let me begin by thanking all the panelists uh, to chinki who i think has a busy schedule as an editor of a journal and special thanks to tushar ji uh, in spite of some personal issues i think uh, he made it point to attend today's session and our young friend shubham and also hilal i think uh, as samriddhi uh, have rightly said it was a captivating Uh, presentation of i think hilal touched on very very important uh, issues uh, so what i would do is i think just touch upon few issues of each presenter but broadly i think uh, there all the four presentations i think have managed to bring uh, i think we all have very very deep shared concerns uh, uh, so a part of the book uh, project was to keep these concerns in mind but also breach that uh, intellectual space i think the, uh, the 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 kind of debate that brief debate that happened between nilal and uh, tushar ji i think uh, is testimony to this that uh, uh, i think we are being pulled in very different directions that there is uh, on one hand uh, an, an intellectual need uh, to to kind of distance ourselves to read it in a very realist way so that we propose new ways of looking which can go wrong which can go right Uh, which have to be at times normative, but which are essentially more in terms of dispassionate uh, reading of the uh, realist. But uh, which is what I think Kilal was hinting at in terms of looking at a long duty picture. But one also agrees with Tushar ji that there is an immediacy. There is a something that is very very immediate. Uh, you know, uh, therefore, the more, my more recent writings uh, attempt have been unlike my previous books. that i think there is an absolute need to breach the academic space to get into a public discourse and i think all said and done india is still i would i refer to india as a very open society that we still have that big public spaces every nook and uh, cranny of india you travel i travel very often and you see that there is still a huge public space <coughs> uh, languages are different the idioms they speak are different Uh, but then as an academics i think it's also our duty to break our own uh, citadels and you know get into those spaces instead of expecting them to come to us i think uh, i think that point that uh, hilal made in terms of the the texture of the book uh, that uh, uh, you know it tries to break uh, you know, it tries to set a new ground but also in terms of a more uh, in a in a lucid way that um, also as uh, you know you said that there is a deeper theoretical point but i think we'll have to learn i think i have learned this over a period of time thanks to my media friends like chinki and others who compel you to write that you'll have to learn you know you know hilal to share early writing of mine in uh, media you know a number of my articles chinki were rejected by hindu and other they said this is all too theoretical it just makes no sense you know then i really didn't know what is theoretical i mean i felt many of 
I was saying very lucid things. But then I learned over a period of time. How do you not compromise on the uh, no depth of the idea? But I think there is a way. Uh, you know, there are also other scholars that I learned, like Partha Chatterjee and other. I think Hilal, your own writings are also testimenting that we have all learned this skill over a period of time. That you know, there is a way in which uh, conceptually complex ideas. There is there are limits to it. You know, but there is also a way in which I think we can reach out to a larger public. You know, when I go to public talks. Uh, I'm coming to. I'm going to Mumbai. Uh, there, you know, people want us to discuss these issues, you know, in public spaces. And I think there is a language in which uh, that can be communicated. And uh, that's where I don't think we have to be this kind of very self-conscious academics of not wanting to uh, breach those spaces. So in that context, I think, as I think it was very clear in all the uh, you know presentations that there is something very troubling about current times that we don't understand. That, you know that we are not we are not getting a grip. There is a a deep sense of an unease from all angles. I think that's where uh, you know Hilal made this very beautiful point that it is not merely about Hindutva and you know uh, communalism, but there is something else, something more. That and I think Hindutva is a test, you know, is a more manufactured, visible uh, kind of uh, uh, you know imagery of that. That there is something larger that's happened. So we are looking at different vantage points to get into an entry, a lateral entry to understand what is it that we are not understanding. You know, what is it that we are our uh, writings are unable to what why is it that such expansive you no know, idea we have about political theory such long uh, you know training and tradition of theoretical categories are again there is something more in excess you know the points that chinki began with you know for the, this recent things like cheetahs you know prime minister goes to a public meeting and asks everyone to stand up and greet with respect in white cheetahs like i'm in a state of shock for you know what does this mean you know and people are doing this you know welcoming cheetahs you know now karnataka election like we are all waiting with always this waited you know waiting break that what would he do because all the thing is you know zero is on to mr modi's last minute and then you saw suddenly now he says some international conspiracy secession of karnataka earlier gujarat he said mr manmohan singh took some supari I mean, we, I can't even make sense of these things. What, what are we talking about? What is this supari business? Who is, who is there to? I mean, then you know, is Bajrang Bali? It is suddenly, and, and I don't know. I mean, it, things seem to resonate. I mean, if elections are as we still continue to believe it's a free and fair elections that we are fighting, uh, definitely we are not getting that local idiom in which people are. Therefore, these have some kind of multiple significations. Uh, you know, therefore my. My critique that Hindutva is not this consolidated singular thing that you know we can simply refer to it as some kind of an anti-Muslim thing. Of course, that's a big part of it, but it's also a very dangerous red herring that you know if you just keep focusing on that anti-Muslim thing, I think we miss a lot of other things which they are recalibrating by keeping our attention focused on this singular thing of communal secular kind of a binary. But they're also doing welfare, you know. So you no, know, they are doing these medical things. They are doing a uh, no Hilal. You have written about the charitable state. They are changing the terms of reference in a very very dramatic way. Uh, I think so. Therefore, this fixation on you know everything being Islamophobic, I think really is a red herring. They want us to do that. That they want us to be fixated on one thing. But while that Islamophobia itself actually means multiple things on the ground. And it, it, it is recalibrating very terms. I think it is gradually. Bringing back the old patron-client kind of uh, hierarchical imagination, it is moved, pulling us away from an imagination of rights and dis, you know citizenship. It is it, we do not even understand what it is doing to caste. You know, the, look at the appeal that this has among caste groups that we thought would be some kind of natural actors against would resist. You know, given the long Ambedkarite tradition, but we do not know what is happening. Whether the caste equations are working very uh, differently on the ground, and it's not even that you know. You simply go visit this uh, you no know, field, and you get a sense of what is happening. Even if you go repeated, my I repeatedly uh, go for uh, brief surveys, but you do not get an immediate sense. Why would you know social constituencies that we would brand this politics as being caste Hindu politics, but there is something else happening on the ground that uh, uh, unlikely social groups are getting attracted. Uh, to this kind of politics, then you then you try to imagine that there is a more lateral entry. I think a larger cultural categories of things that we would want, like what Tusharji's 
you know very passionate presentation uh, you know uh, uh, brings forth you know that our commitment to that old gandhian kind of an imagination of a very compassionate india it is possible to charge that this politics is actually signifying for people that kind of compassion for us it signifies hatred for us it signifies a hierarchical order i think that is where the trick is uh, that is where that we might have to it is may not be just about hatred for people you know that's where you know point that vilal made that very important point between ethics and morality i think people have everyday ethics uh, there is a normative sense in which you know you look at daily rights i mean in spite of everything people protected muslims their neighbors you know they treated them as their neighbor so we'll have to account even for those i don't think these are merely instances of aberration but people enter through ethics and i think some sense of capturing those everyday ethics and cultural codes by the rss is precisely signifying what we intend to do that for us gandhi he symbolizes that idea of compassion but it could be possible that on on the ground that the hindutva today is signifying that compassion which will be very baffling for many of us that why should you know hindutva might be capturing that normative universal order that more inclusive order when they say sabka saath sabka vikas so this upturning of uh, you know uh, uh, this normative order that they are exactly projecting themselves to be what we actually are talking about uh, could be and therefore i think that is where the opposition parties are at a complete loss you know simple emphasis repeated emphasis on secularism constitutionalism democracy i think actually means nothing on the ground you know that we will have to therefore find uh, an ethical language we can have to find narratives we have to find performance we we'll have to find stories Uh, which can upturn this, and I, I feel that is the big crisis that we are in. I think it's not that India is getting into a big uh, civil crisis or we are ending going to end up with a civil war. I mean, yes, violence is becoming normalized at a pace that is very disturbing for many of us. Uh, now, as Chinki was pointing out, that you know, you talk to your own relations, it's shocking the way they justify bulldozers, the way they are justifying encounter killings. Uh, you know, that has definitely has gone up that normalization of violence. Uh, but I think more than that, what is happening is that that they have upturned the entire progressive, liberal left, Gandhian. a uh, kind of a uh, value system that we all valued is what they have they seem to have somewhere or they have learned from us but therefore the question is what is that we can learn from them you know in the sense learn in the quote unquote learn is that what is it that this whole construction of narratives this whole trust on the leader we have moved from representation to identification people very strongly identify with the leader you know in spite of the economic crisis so there are all these questions which might need a moment of dispassionate what uh, you know uh, ilal very beautifully put i think there is a intellectual project there that will have to stand couple of notches uh, you know at par and then look at the process what what is happening i don't think we have made complete sense of uh, what is happening and that is where we'll have to also reassess this whole hindutva project as to you know part of the if you look at the way religion they are using Uh, is it about religion or is it a political ideology? We don't know. I mean, this is this itself is a very big question. I think very elementary questions we do not have clarity and definitive answers. You know that uh, is this are people receiving Hindutva politics as 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 religion? And if it is religion, is it in the cultural sense? Is it in the communitarian sense? Is it in the spiritual sense? Or is it simply a political ideology? that people are you know that that they have simply weaponized religion is that what is attracting uh, people you know in my own surveys people have given such baffling answers you know that you know about from from pulwama to, to all that we have been discussing that people have a sense what is happening it's not that people do not have a sense that's where i think the limitation of this idea of lies and manipulation you know that as long as we think people are being manipulated and lies i think people have a sense of what is happening but people would still want to go ahead and that's our bigger challenge and if it was just about manipulation and lies i think it's a much simpler project you know that then there's an all we need is an alternative narrative strong narrative but imagine a situation where people have a sense of that this could be a trumped up uh, charges uh, that muslims are not so dangerous as it's being projected if that is the case and in spite of that people are lending their consent uh to to uh, to order that is very toxic uh, that's very disturbing and that, that's where i think we are losing the case that's where we do not understand that 
what would uh, you know make people uh, therefore in my uh, you know recent uh, you know last week we had a discussion somebody asked this very useful question that that then if that is so then why is it that only offensive emotions are you know uh, attracting people why not better emotions why not compassion why not love why not friendship uh, again this is a very complex question i think we'll have to raise new questions of this kind so part of that answer i think i've answered i mean i tried to take it up in section on media you know this question of speed you know that speed and scale you know bullet trains you know there is everything that is largest sardar patel statue biggest parliament building this whole idea of large big speed scale uh, this this whole fulcrum of modernity that is right at the heart of it uh, is somewhere also giving is lending an imagination that itself is already violent you know that is that, that that that's not independent you know that's only a mat, it's, it's it's a separate fact that that muslims are the target of this violence uh, uh, but but these are two very separate things that i think we are already a very we have already been very violent you know if you look at the south delhi colonies and you just talk to neighbors that the violence is very 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 uh, chinki would perhaps know this you know that it's very 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 visible that is only a matter that somebody has to come and implant with the kind of history we have had muslim as the target it could very well be dalit it could very well be immigrants it could very well be a housemaid i mean so so i think there are other ways in which we will have to raise uh, this uh, these questions and also the question that you know you raised in terms of the social and the political you know i think shubham also touched on this uh, question i think one of the problems with much of opposition parties has been that uh, uh, we only came to respond uh, in in a political sense you know in an electoral sense but rss is working round the year you know, 24/7 uh, it is a cultural and a social project uh, they, they they have an entry into families uh, you know they have interpersonal uh, relations there are very microscopic spaces that they enter into but our project has always been exclusively modernist in terms of being exclusively political ideological and institutional so there is no that effective interpersonal dimension to our politics though we do that you know maybe we have a prayer meeting uh, but i think gandhian ethics uh, go much deeper i think gandhian ethics meant that our politics have to be round the year you know uh, gandhi uh, uh, did not perform uh, during election gandhi wore clothes which were his clothes that's what he was he did not perform at a time you know during election that's what perhaps modi ji does but gandhi lived that life that he believed in that you uh, know so i think how do we get back to that is there space for that kind of an alternative cultural social mobilization that has to be long due you know you cannot today we do not have except rss there is no cultural organization of that size and that scale which works around the earth. and there are other conceptual epistemic confusions that i touch upon uh, in my forthcoming work also is that i think this whole business of secularism uh, this question of solidarities that we are talking about chinki refer to imperfect solidarities i think we are at a cusp of raising uh, these questions all over again so today when we talk about secularism and tolerance between hindus and muslims Uh, rss has a very concrete picture of what that means do we have you know you know that what does it mean for hindus and muslims to cohabit now i think today with the digitalization lot of microscopic issues have come to the fore uh, we do not have clarity where we stand for instance does our secularism include uh, would we uh, uh, happily encourage inter religious marriages we, we have no clarity does this secularism encourage a cohabitation are we talking about common neighborhoods that where we live together strongly i don't think we have a clarity on that so i think our secularism is a very vague uh, abstract moral idea that we want to cohabit but when it comes to concrete uh, we don't have an idea we are all confused as what does this mean you know what does simply mean that muslims and hindus should live together uh, that's where i think bjp uh, is doing an interesting thing bjp and rss in terms of they're not at abstract level they're talking about solidarity but in the concrete uh, they are encouraging all microscopic conflictual differences between communities not only hindus and muslims but between caste communities you know in bangalore you had brahmin suddenly coming up with an apartment saying that is only for brahmins and i think rss kind of supports that idea they are encouraging conflict between one subsect of dalits with another subsect 
one they are in fact even dividing muslims internally today you know all sects of muslims are being you know pasmandas being encouraged against so i think it is bringing completely new terms of reference to indian politics and unless we don't read this situation laterally i think we will not know where to begin our counter uh, mobilization i think there is a possibility that 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 this this regime is projecting itself as being very revolutionary and transformative regime it is raising all the right questions you know, but, uh, no, we did not as progressives raise question of pasmanda muslim we did not raise question of elitism within muslim we thought you know that's done away. we did not raise question of obc uh, you no know, uh, prejudice against dalits we did not raise a question of gender within dalits you know these are all in our secular discourse i think we were all very uh, politically correct and i think bjp and rss partly because of their deintellectualized existence because they do not as you know tucharji was that's where i think that deintellectualization becomes important that because they don't think too much in intellectual terms in complex categories in long duri historical terms they just do what is very pragmatic they just do what is very practical no no there is a case here they just simply go i mean that may not agree with the case something else you know they go to kerala and their candidate promises good beef the shillong their candidate promises good beef in up you lynch people for so this is a very strange and so on which i think somewhere reflects neoliberal ethics so people i think it captures the way it is not talking about a continuity it is not talking about a world view is talking about very hands on micro way of dealing with things in their immediacy and that's what people are expecting something that's in the media that's where i think within this cosmos supporting bulldozers and encounters makes sense because it's it's, it's as immediate as you know the question of beef and so, so how do we then encounter this immediacy because our politics do not have any immediate solutions we in fact think that philosophy is not about providing solutions it is about deliberation it's about agonism it's about institutions it's about procedures it's about rule of law it's about political niceties it's about endless dialogue this is all good for a social you know background that we all come from but on the ground there is there is an absolute desperation for immediacy and this politics therefore addresses that urge of immediacy what it feels that uh, that sense of immediacy with you know is i think that therefore it's not an open it's not merely an anti muslim thing when people concede uh, uh, you no know, consent to bulldozers and encounters now i think it's also this sense of institutional history that we have had this absolute uh, non responsive and elitist character of institutions laws rule of law policing that we have had all that fractifies into this this consent for encounters you know what do we do with that long history uh so i think therefore the, broadly i think all of you have captured uh, what the book says about therefore the book is really in terms of taking uh, a more lateral entry into this process uh, and not zero it on immediately in terms of communalism polarization and hatred uh, i think that that consent for anti muslim program that uh, rss is building i think is coming from various other sources and unless we don't kind of undo those in those everyday ethics emotions everyday you know all these things speed scale there are i think multiple linkages very complex linkages one can think about uh, uh, and and then i think we can you know trump their project but if as long as we only talk about that anti muslim uh, you know in terms of secular uh, communal thing i think we will miss lot of things as to why that and where that consent is uh, emerging from i think the book is i think uh, an attempt to see where that consent is coming from and i think uh, and we'll have to being a democracy we'll have to trust uh, somewhere down the line at some point we'll have to trust people's consent you know if people are feeling this way you know a majority of in this kind of a humongous nation the country of this size and with this kind of population uh, we will have to somewhere trust people's common sense Uh, the, the fact that that common sense is being weaponized in a specific way is our concern but our our project therefore has to be that we we'll have to provide those lateral entry points for the common sense to work differently uh, uh, and, and 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 it's a very preliminary kind of an attempt to see and as part of that i think we'll have to build a more secular composite uh, and that and there i think one has to question across board 
you know, from from Hindu right to, to Muslim politics, character of elitism within Muslim politics to the limitations within Dalit Bahujan politics, limitation within the constitutional idiom. I think we'll have to take a relook at all of this together to see uh, of uh, of really a kind of quick and fresh uh, possibilities. So I'll stop there. Uh, some. Um, has raised his hand. Does he want to? Um, yes, Shubham sir. Please go ahead. Yeah, three quick points. First of all, uh, as the discussion went on, uh, the more issues could be that in why certainly. Uh, uh, that uh, Hindutva certainly is a political project. It has uh, nothing to do with religion, at least Hinduism. That's what we're bandy about. The reason for this being twofold. First of all, if Hindutva was a, a religious project, I mean, nobody would see a tribal being appointed as the head of the state by uh, the BJP and the RSS, and the Muslim in Natal Bihari Vajpayee's dispensation as the head of the state. So this is certainly a political project. And what explains the coexistence between community, between Hindu and Muslims, before Savarkar wrote his treatise in 1923? Uh, secondly, a uh, welfareism that Ajay is talking about, which is certainly uh, benefiting the BJP, is, is something which the bourgeois states have always done. You see, if you look at the Banrega program that kept the RSS and the right wing forces at bay for another five years. You look in Europe, right? So, certain welfareism being egged out by the bourgeois state does contain the right wing, right? If not forever, at least for a good period of time. Look at the entire uh, project of capitalism after the Second World War, you know. Uh, Anwar in Bevan, the British health minister, gave the NHS, right? And it took almost 30 years for the conservatives to gain power under Margaret Thatcher in, in a manner which is which could be certainly called authoritarian right wing. Thirdly, you know, this divide uh, that uh, some of you mentioned about the intellectual and an activist, I would like to give uh, one of my favorite Aesop's fable as an example. So once upon a time, there was uh, a set of bulls, right? Uh, they were divided in two groups. One were uh, activists, the other were intellectuals. A debate broke out between these two, the intellectuals and the activists, as to who was their real enemy. Uh, the intellectual said that, uh, okay, our keeper is not our main enemy, right? Because he's not the one who slaughters us. He's the one who sells us. The other activist group says that, uh, okay, the real enemy is our keeper because he's the one who's taking our profit by slaughtering us, by selling our meat. And uh, as a result of which, uh, there was no vote, right? And they kept debating uh, the entire evening. And there was no consensus reached as what needs to be done. And on that fateful night, as a result of this deadlock between the intellectual bulls and the activist bulls, they refused to close ranks. And the next day, they all were slaughtered, you see. So this is exactly where we are standing today. You know, if you are seeing the intellectual as uh, sitting on the ivory tower and the activist, okay, he's fighting a losing battle if they don't coordinate, right? Uh, the fate of the bulls await us, you know. We need in uh, intelligent uh, activists, of course, you know, and every intellectual has to be, you know, if he has anything, he or she has anything to do with the project of India, at least the way we know it, you know, a socialist, secular republic. No matter it is, uh, I mean, no, I mean, it has its own problems. Secularism in 2002, I still remember Ashish Nandi declaring it's dead in a conference in the UK, right? So what is dead now? <laughs> you know, if secularism was dead in 2002, what is it that's dying today? So these are the questions that uh, need to be debated by both the intellectual and the activist. The activist needs to become more intelligent than what they are currently. And the intellectual need to become more activist in their approach, in their writing, right? So that that gap is fulfilled and we don't actually, you know, uh, I mean, we are not served the fate of the bulls who failed to reach a consensus and they got slaughtered the next day. So this is how it is, you see. And I myself, I'm doing my PhD. I've been writing all around. But without uh, the battle on the streets, right, nothing could be done. Because ultimately, the solution will lie on the streets, no matter what it is. And the tactic could be chosen. You know, it could be the Gandhi and Satyagraha model. It could be, you know, taking on their forces the way they... I mean, it could be a little violent. I don't know. That has to be 
I mean, there's no end to it. You know, these are tactical questions that need to be, you know, debated as we progress in our fight against the powers that be. But this distinction between an intellectual and activist has to go down, or else the bull analogy should always be remembered. And as I said, that who knows? And I'm working on this piece currently, 2024, the coming of the Third Reich. Would it really be the coming of the Third Reich? So one has to keep these things in mind. But otherwise, these are the three uh, broad points that I want to make. You see. And that's about it. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to proceed with the discussion, please. Uh, I would like to call. I would like to invite uh, Chenkiji to expertly chair and moderate. Uh, for those who have queries, feel free to uh, raise your hands or type them on the uh, Q and A box. Thank you. So I am supposed to moderate the questions. Anybody has questions? If they would like to ask, let me see the chat box. I mean, I have a few questions, so. <laughs> yes, please uh, go ahead, ma'am. No. <laughs> I have this. Uh, I can ask, or is anybody else asking? No, ma'am. It's it's a discussion, so okay. you have to chair it. So you please direct. Okay, great. So I can ask one uh, question: Is that how did you come upon firstly this idea? And uh, there's a remarkable thing that I've noticed in your book, uh, which. Uh, uh, you know, like when we read uh, a lot of these uh, academic journals, uh, it's difficult for us to make sense of it. And this one is written in a very um, easy way. Was it a conscious uh, thing? Because uh, most of the times what happens is that, uh, you know, to make that link, uh, you know, uh, so the language actually and the case study that more of a story telling format that you take and you ask these questions that there's, there's a lot of questions uh, in the book. So I just wanted to ask about the process of writing and how uh, that came about. Yeah, that's an interesting question, Jinky. But that's that's you no know, initially I explained that you know that you know if you look at my early work, it's yeah. certainly theoretical and you know it has it has a niche audience, but it has its own advantage. That all kind of writing, that depth and the categories, it's more in terms of you know you're addressing a certain intellectual tradition of analysis. But obviously, post. 2014, at least from 2010, I think the the ominous changes that have come, uh, that old format did not attack. But there's suddenly a sense of an urgency, and I think uh, one needs to also set, uh, at least intervene in a public discourse in a very different kind. And I could see that in India, because uh, you know, coming from Hyderabad, I have known activists of all kinds, you know, from civil liberties to left to Muslim activists to Dalit Bahujan activists. And so I had a fair idea that India has uh, a big public space. You know that you know, and if, 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 it's, if we can intelligently and in a very more lucid way uh, communicate uh, a complex idea, I think uh, uh, it most often it gets across. You know, people make sense and sometimes in their own way more than the way you would want them to make sense. But I think that is an effort one has to be at. You know, you cannot expect one day that you know you would descend and then, then, then you would have a ready audience. I think you'll have to create your audience as you go along. So part of that, you know, I think, you know, response to my public writings has been fairly uh, you know, uh, favorable in the sense that not that they have to necessarily agree with me, but the fact that they can read and make sense in their own way, you know, like there is a lot of response from Dalit Bhojan activists, uh, you know, Muslim activists and intellectuals respond left. Uh, so they're, they're following. So I think if we can have this cutting across debates, you know, uh, uh, I think that, that that makes at least for the current moment, that makes an immediate uh, sense to me. Uh, so that's where, as I told you that I've learned, you know, uh, editors like you have been rejecting my pieces early part. You know, I didn't even reject it. <laughs> as I said, <coughs> my early, early intervention, they would say too theoretical, too abstract. What are you saying? We can't make, our readers will make no sense. So I had to pick up, you know, that then, you know, you can't write in a, uh, in a sense that is too simplistic, that, you know, it doesn't make a point. Uh, but then you, you, you don't want to write in a way that nobody reads. And even now people complain in popular media, you know, you write too complex uh, stuff, you know, we can't make sense. But I think that's where you'll have to get into that, uh, uh, you know, uh, some average mode where, 
without compromising on the idea you can push through a, to a larger public discourse because we have such huge social activists cutting in india you know no other country i think has the kind of public sphere that india has you know very uh, you know, lot of activists who are well read who are learned are operating and common people also i think you know my uh, some of my writings when they translated into regional languages like in telugu and bengali uh, people come across in various public meetings and tell that wo peace padata sar aapka maybe sometimes they don't get the nuance but they try to get that you're pushing in a different direction you know like when i'm critical of dalit bahujan or islamophobia is not uh, sometimes people don't get you know they think that we are defending that we think there's no anti muslim you no know? we say no that's not the case but there is this other thing people i think second third round they generally get the you know sense of what one is saying so that was so i had to learn it that was an important thing it was not something that no it's important because we also learned uh, the other way in the sense mm -hmm. that we have to include and we have to be inclusive uh, so we learn get to learn a lot from you guys and we because we you know my one of my academic friends said that you guys are not uh, you guys are observers at the periphery and we are the participants you know an ethnic uh, anthropologist uh, uh, it's a very beautiful thing and i was going to put it in my remark that actually this coming together is a very beautiful thing i feel mm -hmm. and this is just one of these examples there's a lot of academics and tanveer has by the way raised his hand and hilal hilal is there thank you for outlook so yeah, yeah tanveer go ahead please jinki i am not tanveer Oh, is hilal no, hilal no, he also has raised his hand <laughs> oh there is another hand tanvi very tanvi can you hear me can you hear me no, there is a tanvi yeah, yeah. hilal yeah. the confusion oh, okay okay <laughs> <laughs> so she is not she was not referring to you as uh, tanvi there is a tanvi <laughs> yeah tanvi so, hi tanvi yeah hi so uh, so tanvi gets pushed out from this public space you know <laughs> oh, <that's all. laughs> i saw that ad <laughs> yeah so no uh, uh uh it's a nice discussion of course i haven't read the book uh, i i would definitely like to read the book but uh, you know a couple of things what ajay talked about you know that you know uh, we 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 are having a, a very uh, big open space and uh, and there is a very dynamic open space i i i somehow do not agree with this whole idea that you know if he if he means to say that there is a there is a you know india is very huge and large and people are talking about a lot of things so that is fine the chit chat is there you know and of course chit chat is there in every democracy but i would not say that the open space open space is open for everyone right there is a huge marginalization there is a huge exclusion and this is this is moving on a, in a very fast pace for the marginals right and <clears throat> the public space are no more public space it's a private space it has been you know uh, 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 taken over by by what what some people would call it as majoritarian communalism and, uh, and 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 the whole rehashing of the history which is being done you know is a major disruption i would not take it as a continuity it's a major major disruption and uh, and 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 why you know i mean what ajay was talking about that we have to think about beyond this whole whole uh, thing uh, of uh, hindu muslim uh, riots or binary or violence or whatever is talking we have there are a lot of other things you know but you know this is what is at the surface right this is a this is what is at the surface and there are so many layers uh, below this but then the whatever is happening below you know the surface is producing this only so i mean of course it's very important to go deeper within you know within within and we need to have different epistemology to understand the different layers which exist so but the fact is that what is on the surface we can't ignore right and what is on the surface is 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 something which is which is you know taking away uh, i mean uh, what i have been writing is backsliding uh, now to i don't i don't think also in terms of backsliding it is not backsliding it is it is regressing very very fast you know deceleration and regression very fast because today only you know christoph zoffelre wrote in in the express you know mm. and then on this on the same news in the same newspaper you saw in the first page now 
it, there is an attack on moderate Muslims, moderate Hindu women who have, uh, or progressive Hindu women who have married to Muslim, there is an attack on them as well, right? So, so there's a huge attack. So what are our responses? You know, if we say that we, we would go, uh, we would not respond to these changes which are happening on the surface and then look for something beyond this. Uh, but how do we do that? Uh, I'm not there in the public space. I'm not there in, in, in the open space. Uh, there's so much of fear, you know, across university, you see in university, so much of fear. And this fear is generated by this whole politics of hate. So what do we do with this fear? I discuss things with my wife. I discuss things with my close friends. But when it comes to an organized challenge against this kind of a project, you know, I'm, I, I, I can't do that. So why can't we talk about, you know, uh, in the ethics and emotions about the kind of fear which is generated? which has its own purpose, right? So this is what I, I mean, uh, 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 India doesn't have a democratic open space uh, in, in, a, in a real sense, what, you know, perhaps uh, uh, what uh, people would call a, uh, as a civil society. So I don't think it's like that. Yeah. Well, thanks, uh, Tanvir. Uh, Chiki, I'm responding to him. Yeah, now, yeah, I was just going to say, Hilal ji, now. Let me respond to Tanvir briefly and then we can move to and on. hilal will hilal uh, remain hilal and tanvir will remain tanvir <laughs> <laughs> this uh, hand yes, thing is very similar so no, no, it's yeah it's uh, confusing yeah. sometime online so tanvir i think thanks that's a very important caution you have given yes i think we are all in the immediate concern as tusharji has also put it you know that the anti muslim thing is the immediate uh, very very worrying thing that also the possibility always of uh, uh, break out of violence, uh, as you said, uh, pushing out of Muslim biases, or as you today pointed out, you know, some BJP MP talked about uh, all Muslims are intolerant, but uh, even the moderate Muslims, I think perhaps they were referring to Hamid, Hamid Ansari ji in terms of they get force and all that says, I mean, uh, so all that is very worrying, Tanvir, but uh, uh, the way out, as you rightly pointed out, there is marginalization, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, Simply, you would also agree with me that simply by uh, you know, projecting or re reiterating secularism, we are not going to get anywhere. I think that we have to also somewhere turn around our gaze uh, in terms of what is going wrong with our politics that we are unable to counter this kind of, uh, you know, which, which looks very, very steep at some stage. And that's where I think, you know, I speak about secular sectarianism that we are, we are so divided, you know, that, you know, we talk about all this constitutionalism, democracy, but I think whether it's minority politics, whether it's Dalit Bojan politics, whether it's left politics, whether it's Gandhian politics, whether it's constitutional liberal politics, have all generated very narrow silos, you know, that, you know, this, this whole public ethic that we have, that, you know, Muslims will speak up only when there is a Muslim at the receiving end. And Dalit versions will speak up only when, look at this whole death of your colleague, uh, Samar Raveer. You know, where are the Dalit Bhajan organizations which fought for Rohit Pemla? I would say in a healthy, democratic, secular society, we should have all those social organizations that fought for Rohit Pemla. Today should be at the forefront fighting for Samar Raveer. But that this, this, this imagination simply does not exist in our uh, ethos. Now, where is uh, Mr. OYC when a farmer's movement happens? Unless somewhere we think in a formidable way in terms of this cross-caste, cross-class, uh, cross-sectoral alliances, where you know, we develop genuine concern beyond our identities. So our identity is one pegging point. I think unless we don't learn that social ethic, I think it's, it, it is Hindutva by other means, you know, that we are all Hindutva in the softer sense and there is now a harder uh, version of it. Uh, I think and the failure of Nehruvian secular politics, uh, I think has been this that you know it has it, uh, that, that it uh, developed all these ghettos between social groups you know then that, that that in itself is projecting as I see it a deep sense of collective indifference to uh, all those who do not share our immediate identity. So that's what is, you know, now has become a public ethic, you know, that and that is visible, I would say, across all social groups. There is no exception to this, whether it's caste Hindus, whether it's Dalit Bhajans, whether it is Muslims, whether it is uh, left sectarianism, whether it is liberal constitutionalism. I think we have all thought in very, very narrow 
uh, nocilos, you know, that which are very self-referential. Uh, it, it all this oppositional politics of producing new kind of social elites. Uh, and those elites and it boiled down to everything boiled down to question of representation. Now we are in a, such a desperate condition that we can neither move beyond representation nor representation as it does any work, anything useful. So that's where I think the, the bigger crisis is. Therefore, unless we don't think, step back and think beyond, you know, that this, what you're calling extreme marginalization, therefore has to produce a new ethic. It cannot work within the you know, dominant narrative. And then we cannot think that within the dominant narrative, we will, we will have to. That's where I for, partly feel people don't see us as alternative because we are not presenting an alternate. You know, we, we are talking in the same idiom. And, and uh, Hindutva is uh, deepening that idiom. You know, we talk in terms of Dalits, Muslims, this, that. And the Hindutva is saying these differences are real. So make the conflict more steep. So, so when we go back with a secular idiom, I don't think it's making sense to the common sense of uh, India. Therefore, my point is that step back and let's talk of a new idiom. And, and that, that new idiom to begin with is, is these two things. One, strong structural welfareism. In all my interaction with uh, political leaders, I said that we will have to talk beyond transactional welfareism, you know, not giving uh, sanitary pads, cycles, uh, laptops, and all this. Talk of structural welfareism, free common school education system, free and quality education for all, from KG to PG with where Dalits, Bhaujans, Muslims all study together. And this will create a new mood. But, but for that, we'll have to fight our own cultural prejudices, our own social uh, you know, anxieties. Uh, we, unless we don't begin that process in a very serious way, Tanvir, I think uh, it's, it looks like a very losing battle. You know, this just secular, constitutional is not making any sense for common people. We will have to tell them there are new aspirations through a new language. And then test our luck. Even if that doesn't work, then God save us. I had a question, but before that, I just wanted to say that you know you're very right because in Goa I was uh, there, and then there was this taxi driver, and huh. we were having a discussion in the back about constitution, and he's like, "Ye constitution kya hai?" So I said, "Why don't you Google all the type of things?" <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> At that level, how do you like? You know, we can all, we can all talk about intellectuals and this and that. Exactly. But ultimately, you are addressing that. It's damn difficult because they don't read that much. They are only yeah. watching things. So there has to be a new way to kind yeah. of address, to kind of engage, and to kind of like you know. I mean, another example is like secular, for example. And you touched upon it, by the way. A lot of people don't even know what the secularism is. Mm. So yes. much at a loss to, uh, you know, there was this uh, one editor who said that our secularism is different from the French model, which yeah. is that something you know i said but religion we are not supposed to uh, uh, be like looking at religion i mean state has no religion so yeah. no religion to respecting all religion is kind of bringing in religion then right so people mm. actually don't understand this also so yeah so it's all all of these things and i think uh, it's a it's interesting that it's a book of questions and it's very important to ask these questions i think we've not begun to ask questions so yeah so professor hilal Ahmed, yeah before to... before hilal comes i think i will just narrate this you know the last couple, three days back you know both tanvir hilal you know i was at a restaurant uh, no, yeah and, uh, the guy who was uh, serving us was from manipur so i asked him what is happening you know manipur suddenly why this eruption he gave a very interesting logic. He told me that this is cookies are doing it and cookies are with Myanmar who are smuggling guns and drugs. So what is this new reasoning? <laughs> so it was all it's about actually it. not new. If you go not, there, all kinds uh, of bizarre reasons, you know, like... Yeah, then he showed me a WhatsApp message where he showed all this uh, cookie smuggling of guns from Myanmar and <laughs> this is a completely different thing operating on the ground. And we are talking of Methi reservation, ST, uh, things of that kind. So, yes, Ilal. First of all, uh, I apologize to you for that. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, three, three quick points uh, and then I'll stop. Uh, the first point is about, uh, you know, because uh, what Ajay said uh, in relation to his general comment and then what he said uh, once again conveyed uh, is basically important, uh, but uh, the search for new idioms should not be restricted to uh, the people who 
only speak English. There is a need to recognize what is happening in Indian languages. That's one. Second thing is that what I understood uh, from the discussion is that we need to, uh, because we come from a talkative society, we speak a lot. Uh, what is actually important is not to search for answer, rather the question. Uh, this book is important because this book is forcing us to find out what the question is, not giving us answers. So what the question is, is, is important. And for that, we have we require some kind of answer. Uh, the third thing is, uh, this is not the first time we are, and that's why, uh, you know, we have to understand not merely the history of our intellectual tradition, but also the history of our activist tradition. This is not the first time that intellectual activist uh, engagement is talked about. We have a long history. In fact, there was an intellectual project uh, led by Edward Shields, and that book came out in 1960s. But I'm not talking about any intellectual, uh, you know, uh, development in that regard. But there are people, for instance, uh, in Ulisa, there is something called Ulisa Ganvesh Nachatka. They have been organizing intellectual activist Sambad, I think for 50 years. There is a, there is used to be a Marx club in Bengal, where activists from different political, uh, from different left circle would interact with intellectuals. There was a, a, a group uh, in Delhi University, uh, which was called, uh, which always organized something called Grassroot Politics Colloquium for 20 years from 1980 to 2000. And that group then graduated to a new entity called Creative Theory. So this is not for the first time that we are talking about intellectual activist engagement. Uh, Azharian Engineer is a great example of that. And in fact, if we go back to uh, that tradition and we go back to Gandhi, you may find that Gandhi was not, uh, you know, he actually resolved in an inter intelligent way. We must remember that Gandhi right, used to write a lot. And most of his ideas are always available to us in written forms. What he said, something very intelligent in, his, uh, in, in, in one of the articles which he wrote for his newspaper, he said that if I die, you know, you get rid of everything except the practice. So that centrality of practice was has been, uh, uh, it has a, a tradition of its own. So therefore, we need to actually don't think that as if that activist intellectual dialogue is something which is entirely new. We have to have some kind of a deeper understanding of the of 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 Indian tradition, Indian post-colonial Indian intellectual and activist tradition. If we don't, then you know uh, we need not to import activist, uh, you know, activist intellectual dialogue from the West. We had our own tradition: Lohia, Ambedkar, Gandhi himself, Jayaprakash Narayan. All of these people were great intellectual in their own right, but they were the activists. So the, there is no conflict. Rather, we have to look at the ways in which activist and uh, intellectual dialogue has been happening in the country for over 60 years. So I think we have to actually revive that tradition. We have to go back to that tradition and only then we will be able to answer the question this uh, this book is poses. Thank you. Okay. Uh, before we go to Mr. Tushar Gadi, there's a question by Arjun S. Mohan for Ajay. Uh, for Hindutva proponents, the secular discourse is something that should re ideally treat all religions equally. However, all religions aren't the same but different. For instance, if we can measure gender discrimination, it might show different levels of among Hindu, Muslim, or Christian communities. So the fundamental question that revolves in my head is that can different religions really coexist, co cohabit together in an increasingly interacting society in harmony? Uh, so this is a question for Ajay from Arjun S. Mohan. Yeah, I think uh, no, that's a question that all of us are raising, you know, that what does this new secular, as he rightly pointed out, I think that last part of his question is the most important, that we are into modern complex societies where interaction, uh, 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 even as we socially get I think the digital media uh, is right in our drawing room. So we know more about how Muslims live, what happens. Uh, so there are, that's, that's not leading to more cohabitation, but that's obviously leading to more anxieties. 
that part of that uh, reason for that anxiety is what i was pointing out that uh, we really do not know what this solidarity means you know chinki you put it as imperfect solidarities uh, but that i think this this imperfection and this uh, that's what is leading to an, at a at a different level it is leading to an urge for more stronger bonds you know that authentic community i think that's uh, no more direct which i see at, at at the heart of it is a positive ethic that people are looking for stronger bonds but at the moment it is coming across globe whether it is about turkey whether it is uh, turkey it's against kurdish that's america it's against uh, no it's about white working class so everywhere people are looking but at the moment it is coming at a sharper exclusion you know in indian case it is muslims uh so i think we'll have to make this nuance distinction that what people are looking for is a sense of belonging it's not that they 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 can no condone and concede all this toxic majoritarianism that's happening uh, but do we have a project where we can offer that sense of belonging what does our secularism mean for both and hindus and muslims to cohabit so that's where the question is important in the sense that i don't think we have an idea i don't think our, our mode of secular mode of dealing you know was uh, 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 is very surrender pitters it, it it doesn't answer questions you know we hang things unlike gandhi i mean gandhi has therefore very important clues i think gandhi as uh, ilal was rightly pointing out is a very hands on thinker you know he did not have very elaborate vocabulary you know this example of in nokhali when he went to forge you no know, you know, communities together he invited children from both the communities you know that's so he wanted to just demonstrate to both communities look in everyday life you are the same you know you are not so different so this whole gandhian i think mode of thinking was a very intelligent hands on mode of uh, thinking so we'll have to reinvent gandhi for our contemporary times and therefore gandhi did not have much patience for law institutions elaborate you know institution he went his entry point was personal ethics that people you know even during partition uh, you no know, rest of life he in fact wanted to spend in pakistan and he said everything is here in our heads all these prejudices floating in our heads so i think we'll have to take those very hands on thing and see you know how in modern complex societies what are those alternate i think ethics that we would want you uh, know what kind of we need some some concrete manifestation of that you know uh, that i don't think we have a very concrete idea of what this solidarity after all means the most i can think of is that we need a strong welfare state to begin with that caters to all communities which i think will change the mood uh, in the nation you know not this transactional welfareism anymore uh, health education and employment basic income i think these are three strong demands opposition should push by 2024 which is inclusive of all social groups dalits muslims obcs everybody included i think that will give at least a starting point for groups to begin to think that we are common you know there's something that and we are not at each other's cost new liberalism has pushed that competitive ethic that every right comes at the cost of some other group so we have already congress through neoliberal reforms i think has already laid that space and bjp came and projected muslim uh, as that universal enemy so that's why i say that you know if you just begin with communalism we may not so we we'll have to do so many so much of other spade work on the ground before we kind of disentangle people from this growing uh, no muslim hatred yeah i think sushar ji had a sushar had a question you know i don't have a question but i just have a comment comment uh, yeah okay, yeah i'm sorry uh, we are discussing but i'm just making a comment yeah. uh it isn't as if uh, <coughs> the fanatics haven't been uh, pushed back a bit mm. uh, in recent times uh, unfortunately what has happened is uh, every time there has been a push back we've allowed them to push harder and spring back if you look at uh, uh, the uh, anti uh, nrc uh, ca protest the shine bag sitting for a time being they were left uh, you know they they were mm. wondering what was happening till they successfully managed to brand it as a muslim uprising uh, against a law that was supposed to keep the muslims in check kind of thing and uh, the delhi riots then completely discredited the whole thing and we allowed them to uh, you know get away with the narrative 
that uh, this was all uh, the Muslim uh, uh, lash out against them. The farmers' protest really pushed them back on the back foot. Uh, but once again, we allowed them to slowly start the whisper campaign about Khalistan being revived and the Khalistanis, uh, you know, coming through this farmers' protest and all that. And they stole the mark. For some time, Rahul's Bharat Jodo Yatra did leave them speechless. But unfortunately, the Congress as a party completely betrayed that initiative and has the, lost the uh, initiative. The, the entire goodwill that Rahul had earned, the party has filtered away. And so every time, unfortunately for us, there has been a solution offered of how to counter mm -hmm. these forces of hatred. It's like, you know, uh, 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 I, I am a cricket uh, devotee, so I use cricket terms. Every time a bowler uh, bowls three beautiful Yorkers, he uh, bowls three wides and gives away the initiative. So that is what we are seeing happening in the political and social spectrum in India. Every time uh, we feel as if we're going to peg them back and push them, they've pushed back harder. And finally, we have seen ourselves count cornered. Somewhere we have to come back to the belief that it's not just pushes and shoves that are going to win this war. We need to be persistently at it without relenting or allowing them any respite. This is what is lacking. That's what, in the from the strategical point of view, I think this is what is lacking. Thank you so much. And there's one question from uh, Satyam, I, I think. Uh, one second. Just me. No, there are two, three questions, I think. There's one uh, that is coming in front of me is, uh, he wants to know, I would like to know, draw attention to towards uniform civil code in the current Hindutva political framework. Is it like strengthening the Hindutva agenda at the national level? And how shall we conceive it? And this question is to everyone. So whoever wants to. Go ahead, can go ahead. Yeah, maybe Hilal, do you want to come in? Hilal or Tanvir, I mean, not because it's uniform civil code, but maybe you know the debate. Uh, do you want to say something, Hilal? Yeah. Uh, no, basically, uh, you know, this idea of unit, there are two, two answers to that. The question is, is quite a good question. Uh, the first answer is a technical one. Uh, because there is nothing called uh, any draft of uniform civil code that is presented to us. Mm. There is something called an idea which has been there uh, as a reference point in the constitution in which we have been debating for a long time. Wow. The misconception is that uh, as if that the personal laws that are available to different communities are parallel laws, which is absolutely wrong. Because the status, and again, it's a technical explanation. The uh, personal laws, if you look at the from the legal point of view, <clears throat> are like customary laws. And suppose if a customary law is challenged in the code of law, the constitutional law will prevail. That's the basic technical uh, status of personal laws. Yet, uh, <clears throat> the political uh, debate on the idea of uniform civil code is presented as if Muslims, especially Muslims, they had an additional ad advantage for having four wives, 16 children, we, that is stereotypical imagination which we all know. What is interesting is that uh, the Muslim elite also somehow contributed significantly to that. So for instance, during Shabano case, there was a very interesting uh, parliamentary discussion. Ashok Sen was the, the law minister at that time. And uh, he said that why only you, uh, the Muslim leadership wants only um, the civil right uh, as uh, part of personal laws, not the criminal uh, issues. You agree that the criminal aspect of if, if a person is committing a crime, you agree with the fact, okay, fine, we'll go by the secular law. But when it comes to civil civic issues, property, adoption, etc., you would like a separate why. Now, Banatwala, who was MP from Kerala, from Muslim League, he gave a very interesting argument and he evoked Ambedkar. And that's why the misuse of Ambedkar is very significant in this sense. He said uh, that Ambedkar always made a distinction between the state and the government. 
So he said, and I and he quoted Ambedkar in that speech. And he said that Ambedkar was an intelligent man. He said, ideally, we should have a uh, irresponsible vote, but it is up to the government to look at the context in which that can be implemented. Now, this part, the this, this civil, this uh, personal laws are given to us as civic right, and so therefore we stick to that, not the criminal right. So, if the government is ready to give us the uh, personal laws in relation to criminal proceeding, we would be happy to have it. This is actually a very typical Muslim response to the question to that. To that. That's one. The second thing is about the, uh, the relationship between personal laws versus uniform civil code is all about uh, that as if that these are these two things are conflicting. But there is a new debate uh, which has been uh, you know going on for a long time. It's about legal pluralism. Do we need and, and remember that the initial uh, if we look at the feminist movement. Uh, you find that Indian feminist movement initially was of the view that we need a uh, uh, we need a uniform civil code, but that position is now changed. Indian feminist movement and especially the women's feminist, uh, they would argue that we would like to have a democratic and gender just personal laws. Bharatiya uh, Muslim Mahila Andolan is actually talking about that. Now, this Ajay is absolutely right in one sense that because that was an important issue for the secularists, and the secularists did not look into these complexities, especially in relation to the ways in which uh, this whole idea of uniform civil code was misused by the Muslim. Community. And that's why you do not find any serious discussion on the question of UCC among the uh, progressive circles. We thought that this is not the right time. We thought that as if that the moment we talk about uniform civil code, it will affect Muslims. And that's the reason why we did not have any informed discussion. BJP took advantage of that vacuum and they came out with a very interesting proposal that we are going to do that. Now, as far as my understanding goes, they are going to uh, produce a draft uh, probably after 2024 or before 2024. A draft for UCC. Now it could have been we, the progressives. We could have, uh, you know, we would have uh, that to have some kind of a gender just UCC. We failed, and the vacuum created. And this is exactly what I just said that the vacuum created and it was filled up by them. So I think we have to understand not merely from the BJP's point of view, but also from the point of view of uh, the religious elite as well. Yeah. Thanks. And I think Tushar Ji also had a response to the same question. Or yeah, uh, I just again once again I just wanted to say how cleverly they have uh, you know uh, sort of uh, given a complexion to UCC as a thing to put the Muslim in it, his place. You know, uh, the whole debate is Hindu Muslim kind of thing. We fail to understand that several minority religions and communities are allowed to have their personal laws uh, so that their identity is not uh, jeopardized and things. And nobody is debating that. Uh, if, if at all it's going to be a secular uniform civil code, which we hope it will, but it won't, Hindus are bound to lose a lot more than the Muslims ever. The Muslims are only going to lose their ability to marry four times. Well, uh, how has that stopped Hindus from polygamy? Uh, uh, Hindus have been, uh, you know, happily having so many spouses and living with them, and nothing happens to them as long as none of the spouses go and complain. So this whole thing is a clever strategy of getting things justified, exploiting the Muslim phobia, the Islamophobia, and then cashing on that, and then. Uh, pushing through everything and unfortunately for India all those things are half-baked because the people who are pushing it are also suffering from Islamophobia and so they think if we deprive the Muslim of the personal laws that's good enough the others can uh, you know they don't matter kind of. but the day the UCC is going to come in the other minorities are going to stand up and say hey leave our laws alone kind of thing and so that debate also has to be brought into the public view and saying it's not just targeting the Muslims. Don't 
celebrate because you think you're getting even with the muslim you're going to lose out on many things yourself kind of thing. this is where once again they are stealing the march i think thank you i think tanveer has something to say to this uh, so yeah then you please go ahead Can, can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 So you know about this UCC. Uh, I think I think the Hindutva project, you know, is trapped within UCC, and I think it is that where we can build up certain idiom. You know what Ajay was talking about that we can sort of build up an idiom where we can counter. You know because every time I go on television debate and I ask my opponent from. uh the right wing that give me the bucket list of things that you want to uh bring in and make it as a uniform thing and and they are at loss of words because they are always muslim bashing and nothing more than that right so it's a ucc typically has emerged as a hindutva you know instrument of domination creating fear in the minds of muslims only and no other uh, as to sharji was talking about no other minorities because they are their practices are not uh, being talked about right so if we talk if we say that yes we want ucc we are all for ucc but these are the things that we want in ucc right uh, because because hindutva is is the project would be uh, typically uh, 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 let's say a patriarchal caste hindu society where you know not only dalits and muslims and christians and other would be at the margins but also women you know one has to understand and hilal was right that you know the moment we talk about gender just uh, uniform civil code and it will it will go off uh, like uh, you know bubble of water so something uh, uh, this is what i want to say that you know there are lots of instruments of hindutva which is playing with the emotions right of of uh, uh, far right hindus you know conservative muslims also they are playing with the emotions for political mobilization and it is there where we need to have to build up the idiom so i am all for uniform civil code but you know these are the things that we want to bring in in the uniform so let it be a gender just uh, cutting across all religion cutting across all uh, uh, you know uh, uh, communities yeah. okay thank you we have a question from nikhil Joyce, uh, left liberal critique of Brahminism, for instance, as a binary between Brahmins and Brahminism, has not necessarily produced strong subaltern resistance against Hindu politics. So, if we have to produce a cross-community belonging, where do we critique conservatism and where do we accept religious observance as a genuine community identity? So, Ajay, would you like to answer this? Well, <clears throat> that's a good and. Uh... you know much of my contemporary writings actually dealt with this question you know that uh, uh, so there are multiple things that that's true one that this you know blanket critique of brahmanism uh, you know now doesn't really speak on the ground what does it mean to just you know critique uh, uh, to go to hilal i think actually thanks hilal i think thanks a yeah. lot it was great having you on board thank you so much yeah so uh, so yeah so uh, where do we this sense of belonging i think yeah so uh, again as you know we were discussing the context of ucc you know, that i think it has really blocked our vision from raising lot of questions you know this easy binary brahmanism bahujanism you know these kinds of things politically they produce a useful rhetoric but uh, they really block our uh, make us very myopic in terms of raising lot of other questions which we should ideally be raising and because we leave that field open Uh, bjp you know this whole question of what reservations this whole new representation that has come where do we you know recently i wrote a piece uh, titling it as a uh, mezzanine elites you know this not, i think there has to be a different class and our whole question of anti caste politics is centered around reservation representation which caters to just 6% of dalits what happens to the rest 95% neither these new social elites within dalit bahujans discuss about them nor rest of society discussing so the question simple question i ask is look at the migrants 38% of those migrants were lower end obeses neither social justice parties think they are obeses nor we left liberals think they are obeses 
so this whole identity business has created such narrow vision of everything that majority of communities majority of population groups just fall through the cracks that nobody addresses their question and that is where i think bjp's cultural agenda becomes their only entry point to make their uh, presence felt because our secular constitutional progressive category simply have no purchase beyond this uh, therefore we'll have to offer a critic and say that reservations has done its good no doubt it has kept the caste question on board kept it boiling it has forced all of us to think but this is not the group that you know can only legitimately exclusively represent the rest of them these strategies don't work for the rest of the communities that is where i think a larger structural demands alone can work you know a common school system alone can work you cannot have this piecemeal kind of uh, minimalist uh, demand on the cultural front the question of sense of belonging and conservatism i think is again a very uh, uh, touchy issue it's very complex but i think the moment we try to project it through the elitism within each of these groups i think it will take a different turn i think that's where our secular ethos has to what bjp has done we should have done it long time back you know this whole subdivision this whole question of elitism within we our secular is, is we, we are so touchy about political correctness you know that we don't end, we end up addressing anything on board now ucc for instance it also is important for pasmanda muslims it's not just bjp i think pasmanda muslims would need ucc more than others because The, the elites within uh, uh, Muslims do not allow pasmandas marry elite Muslims. There is inter caste marriage is not possible among Muslims. The new CC perhaps would give them that necessary protection. So we will have to read things bottom up. What BJP is interested in doing is producing that optics of bottom up and pushing actually conservative agenda. And we will have to reverse that. We will have to genuinely pick up questions. Uh, a uh, bottom up and through that anti elitist discourse we'll have to gradually uh, it is not the bjp what is that oh no i think nikhil has a point to make should i read it out or yeah, 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 yeah. No. okay it is not the bjp it is not that bjp has understood the way to readdress this crisis of identity dilemma for example anti hijab campaign shows more of the vulnerability and cluelessness of the bjp's hindutva politics is not a genuine critique of any muslim conservative uh, the challenge for secular politics is to combine partly organic nature of hindutva politics with the redressal of this crisis it's a comment yeah it's a comment so yeah that's what i mean i don't think hindutva has any resolution for anything if anything they're deepening the crisis but they're just borrowing that optics you know they are mobilizing lower end obcs against dominant obcs and their overall logic is that by doing that they're actually weakening the dalit bahujan resistance and reinscribing a dominant groups uh, so so they are they they have their project very clear you know there is no doubt in that you know that's not that they are finding moving towards any kind of progressive resolution of this they're buying on the optics uh, that you know a lot of social activists have built laboriously for you know working you know hard Uh, so now we'll have to undo that optics you know that are our secular you know the limits you know framed uh, you know closed our eyes i think we'll have to break that and uh, uh, seize that you know, opportunity of that optics from bjp but we can only do that when we have a bottom up narrative you know, that, that, that there are legitimate concerns within these groups there is a certain sectarian logic within each of these groups and unless we don't offer a more progressive critique uh, i don't think we can I think Shubham and uh, Tushar ji have some. Yeah, I think I have a point to make. And Nikhil is. is no, I think we can yeah, uh, carry on because that will come. Now BJP yeah. has prominent OBC anti-Hijab campaign leader from Udupi. Okay, Tushar and Shubham, you guys can go ahead. Maybe Tushar ji can go ahead. Yeah, Tushar ji can start. Yeah. Sorry, I keep raising my hand all the time. No, I think uh, we 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 are eager to listen to you. <laughs> no, uh, I just wanted to point out the hypocrisy of BJP on UCC. as a party it has been campaigning for ucc for donkey's year and yet its government opposes same gender marriages in sc now wouldn't a ucc address the legitimate rights of the lgbtqi uh, community also wouldn't that be also part of a uniform civil code which is uh, you, you know constitutionally equal for everybody but look at the hypocrisy but 
the thing is that they are successful in getting away with that hypocrisy and as the opposition and activist space we keep failing in uh, uh, in uh, exposing their hypocrisy and showing it to mm-hmm. the people on so many fronts they have these kind of dual uh, arguments and uh, you know divergent uh, strategies to what they are saying and ucc is most blatant if you can put it in comparison to the government's daily opposition uh, to same gender marriage suit in the sc this is our failure that's so and shubham you wanted to say something we can't hear i think he's uh, no, he's muted he's muted yeah right 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 can you hear me now yeah is it better yeah i mean i just read nikhil's point and, uh, and ajay has been saying that there are problems within minority groups which bgp is making a fuss about of course they are but the point is that who will correct it is a majority in india being corrected speaking of this ucc everybody knows what the, the tax rebate that the hindu united undivided family gets right nobody is ready to question that right nobody is ready to i mean nikhil was asking about you know a critique of brahmanism of it becoming redundant in the long run there are you know fishers within dalit communities i mean for instance the lower end of the dalit community they don't uh, eat something touched by the even lower caste say for example the, the chandals will not have i mean the, the jamars will not have anything touched by the chandal but these are not the major problems so they have problems nonetheless but these are transitional problems they don't present a political challenge you know muslim conservatism in india doesn't present a conservative challenge in any manner you know they are just 14% of the population the problem lies as jawaharlal nehru you know very intelligently put had put long back 70 years back that uh, uh, the the communalism of the majority has in its own this thing you know right to become you know uh, to masquerade as nationalism you see this is what is happening there is no no absolute need you know close hand to improve the muslim community from them their conditions is worse than dalits you see all the parents such a committee report the ranganath mishra committee report so what are we going to reform within a community which is under social and economic dilemmas which have been unsolved for almost seven decades the problem is with the majority here right it is it is their communalism it is their caste bias it is the brahmanism which has now spread across community within the hindus that has to be challenged you know so this argument of muslim majoritism and you know dalits and obc divide okay taken the points are taken but they are not the elephant in the room the elephant in the room is that 70% roughly 80% of the majority which is the hindus right hena which has to be tackled their conservatism you know because it is their communalism which will which is masquerading as nationalism jawala nehru had warned us right so these are things that we need to be very 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 careful about and you know any argument about muslims being who is not conservative in india you know who is not i mean i can i mean ajay was pointing about you know micro examples about you know meeting a driver i mean this is in his book i know a friend of mine you know, who happens to be a brahmin he was rejected by uh, a lower caste uh, girl's family because he being a brahmin they were not supposed to i mean they were not the girl was not allowed to marry him now is this a political question to be solved of course not india is a transitional society you know i mean modernity hasn't uh, gotten into the veins of india the social veins of india should have in the way it has captured europe right I mean, these are historical questions but i mean if you in any manner if you are uh, giving a rebate to the hindu hindu majority of their uh, cultural problem and domination and you know their communalism which is now masquerading as nationalism right then you are giving a short short shrift to the powers of hindutva you know this is what they want they want you to get lost okay these problems are not solved they are conservative they are wrong hence you know we will offer you the solution i mean then we are getting into their trap you know, the real challenge is to tackle uh, the communism of the hindu majority you know or nothing apart from that politically at least socially these remain problem i mean you know, conservatism within the muslims the status of women within the muslims right but it is not a, a political problem so to speak you know this is the point that i want to uh, make and press upon so yeah that's about it thank you so much i think there was a uh, there was some uh, glitch and i got locked out and i think yeah the the there's a question from vidita jha sorry i got uh, i think her name wrong 
uh, it would be helpful if the panel could also reflect on the idea of new media in terms of digitization and technology that is also coming to the center of dualism between dissent slash democracy or resistance uh, agency and the idea of regulating these spaces also in cases of artistic expressions and then uh, i know we are running out of time but if somebody can quickly uh, you're not the right this. person you are no, the right, the right person. person i should i go and address <laughs> you should briefly address what is okay. happening with the <laughs> okay i will uh, basically uh, we are in the era of click and bait journal click bait journalism what is called and uh, we have been facing the brunt of this uh, ever since i joined outlook for one and a half years what happens is that people love to read uh, these kinds of uh, things that are uh, totally voyeuristic you know you have like a mob lynching situation going on and people just want to watch those videos now what happens is because uh, those videos are going viral you are under pressure to and that's what i meant by new manufacturing and digital uh, digi digitization of media has a lot to do with that because we are all under pressure uh, the other thing is that uh, you have to fight uh, fake news and how do you do that we don't have resources um, advertising has become very uh, this thing you have this entire television media staring at you in the face uh, so you know the, the only two options that we have is to kind of um, you know resist this uh, clickbait and with that you know it's, it's also dangerous for us you know so how long do we sustain them so yeah so the new media is uh, problematic uh, and uh, there's a lot of this uh, this thing that is parading uh, uh, in terms of, I mean, there's no fact checking. I mean, nobody has resources. Then you are under constant pressure to get 50 million or 20 million or 40 million uh, hits. And, uh, you know, because that will then translate into advertising. So, see, there's all this uh, uh, this thing that happens. So it, it's kind of, I mean, I don't know if I've addressed your question, but uh, the regulation of these spaces, I'm not sure how would you do that because uh, any censorship then will become a precedent you know so you invoke censorship in one then you'll have to do uh, in another uh, other cases as well artistic expressions of course i mean if you look at uh, vivek agni vivek uh, the kashmir files and now this kerala story i mean this banning and all that i'm not sure if i i, I think that's the right way i think the challenge has to come from amongst us and uh, obviously these things will provide uh, triggers and I think we need to figure out a way as Ajay said to kind of counter these and challenge these things and ask more questions I think we're not asking enough questions um, and we are only trying to create uh, uh, you know this uh, whole thing of being uh, who we are in terms of blue ticks and all of these things and that because that's become another problem by the way or when journalists have become public celebrities and they kind of want to do these debates on Twitter and things like that just to get attention and that's where we are like losing out on uh, interesting debates and discussions and discourses that we are supposed to be doing in this space. And we are not really doing any journalism. So that's the danger of new media in terms of uh, money and uh, advertising pressure and all kinds of other pressures. And of course, there's a lot of uh, other pressure on us. So we we have figured out a way at Outlook, you know, I mean, not the entire way, but some way, you know, we, mm -hmm. we have been able to address issues like federalism and secularism and we have done covers on uh, you know uh, you know this uh, hubli and ayodhya and all of these things and uh, even on ram by the way questioning uh, ram because the bjp wanted this one thing of ram which was basically that television serial in the in the 90s i think uh, we have been able to do it in a very creative way and we have become very inclusive of everybody like as i said poets writers uh, academics everyone and i think uh, we constantly look for ways to kind of uh, beat this. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's what uh, it, it so is. I, I have a quick question, Chuching. So what 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 has been your experience when you project these alternatives? Do people positively read and respond? Is there I mean is there space for that kind of? As you said, a lot of young readers are reading your stuff. You know, following Outlook. So when you follow something like Ram, you know, what what is the assessment you have that do they? Yeah, actually, that's an interesting question. See, our circulation has gone up uh, despite taking these radical steps, which mm -hmm. means there is a, I mean, we decided to go for it rather than just wait for things to happen or to go by what the status quo was in terms of doing agency kind of news, like, you know, uh, to get content uh, going, you know, you have like a, a woman bites a snake or a woman bites a dog, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> anyway, so we, <laughs> we took this radical decision that <laughs> I know it's funny, but that's, I mean, it, 
we have to deal with so much. Uh, so we basically asked uh, our, uh, uh, you know, the, the CEO that uh, can we take like, can we do this for three months? And if it doesn't work, uh, I'll quit. What else? <laughs> so, so we did it and it kind of worked for us. And now if you look at Outlook website, we only do packages. We, we are not equipped to look at each and every issue that comes up because that's also kind of like giving into that, uh, you know, the, the thing that they are manufacturing. Mm. So we will take the news and at least do four stories around the news because Outlook, nobody's coming to read breaking news any which ways. Mm. And we have to find our space, right? So we took a conscious decision to not do what everybody else is doing. I think there's a lot of space under the sun to do the kind of things that you want to do. Mm. Uh, so for instance, I'll tell you that we have decided that we'll go into maybe, uh, you know, kind of changing the discourse a little bit, like reshaping, reconfiguring, uh, those kinds of things. So for example, one of the one of the issues that we did was on witch hunting. Now we, we only do special issues. We don't do anything else but one issue. And we mm. took look at 360 degree angle kind of thing, because I think that was what I was not able to get when I was reading other magazines. Uh, for instance, I would look at one cover story, but I'm not able to understand who's thinking about this from this angle or that angle and as a woman i think that also made a change because there have been no women editors you know I mean, in, in this political spectrum that too uh younger in terms of uh the, the i'm not young but whatever uh so also to look at news from a woman's point of view is very very interesting because health and education as you talked about matters to us uh in male dominated newsrooms it's always defense and, and these press conferences modi said this modi mm. this whole muscular masculine energy that mm. comes in and i always i used to tell tanvir that you know women are a caste on their own so we take issues like witch hunting for instance and because for us it's important to do a consolidated issue uh, looking at uh, the, the witch hunting thing and where it's coming from for, for example uh, we didn't get into trouble for doing uh, this whole thing of sarna jal jangal mm. jameen we took the sarna flag on uh, on the cover of outlook and that was important for us because we Practically, I had no idea what this was when Draupadi Murmu came. There was a video that went viral. I think if you don't, mm. I don't know if you remember, but of the there was protest. this whole something happening. Mm. Uh, there were like all these priests surrounding her, and this friend of mine said, "But she's Sarna," and I'm like, "But yeah, but Sarna, I knew a little bit, but not so much." Uh, and like, I mean, the journalism gives you that opportunity, and I think a lot of people are not taking that opportunity to admit that maybe perhaps we don't know. Let's go to the ground, and that's the only thing we can do. Uh, we don't do this air conditioned room situation now anymore like phone journalism we go to the ground we make resources available so yeah so this is an experiment in progress and uh, we were the first ones to actually take fiction we publish mm. fiction as well because i think when you talk about politics of emotion you know kazu ishiguro wrote that book clara and the sun and clara and the sun actually talks about dystopia and this ai coming in and it's very similar to kind of, uh, I mean, it's very important for us to also look at fiction, to look at poetry, to not just look at what forensic evidence gives us, because I don't think that's enough. Mm -hmm. uh, so there we are, I mean, and we need help from all of you guys. And I hope that answers your question. It's been very challenging though, yes. but it's fun. Very interesting. It's a lot of fun also, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I can, I think, uh, yeah. I think we should conclude. We'll have we may have questions with apologies to those we are not able to address, but uh, we can take it up in you know, some other format. No, and one other thing is that Vitita think that yeah, we, we are being regulated by the state. Of course we are. You have the UAPA threat hanging <laughs> all the time. So we do have <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's that is true. We, but we operate, I mean, find ways. I think uh, innovation is important. Uh, um Thank you for the amazing session, everyone. Uh, I would like to go ahead with the vote of thanks. Okay, thank you. Well, um, I don't know how to do a vote of thanks, but I'm extremely happy uh, that uh, Ajay, uh, you know, wrote this book at a personal level and at a professional level as well. I think a lot of people, when I talked about this politics of celibacy, when the Dalai Lama thing happened, a lot of people questioned us saying that, you know, you only see politics in everything, you know, politics of this, politics of that. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, but the second generation feminist said personal is political and all that. And they said, is a political. <coughs> it is a vindication of sorts for uh, for us at least. And it's a, it's a book of questions, as I've said, and it's very important. And what I think 
uh, where he is very good, and I think that's something that we can learn, is how to ask these questions. Because he presents these case studies, he makes an argument, and then he poses the questions to you. And I think that's very, very important for us to learn in terms of uh, asking the right questions, because I think we're so conscious of asking questions. And I think in journalism, one thing we have taught very early on is that do not be afraid of asking very stupid questions also, because you know, somewhere you find something, you know, and you don't have to sound very intellectual all the time because I think that's not what is important. I think it's important to ask questions. And I um, think, um, uh, you know, he's, he's talked about a lot of interesting things. I think the celebrity thing also he touched upon, oh, which is uh, quite interesting about this projection of RSS as morally upright because they are doing abstinence. And this question of abstinence is very important uh, to look at because in India, I've always said, I mean, we did an issue like this also, because, you know, if you look at women and men, they're almost always celibate. I don't know what they're trying to say, but like Nitish Kumar, you know, uh, JL Alita, you know, so somebody said that this desh mein aap didi aur ma amma ho sakte hai, aap kabhi bhabi or, you know, whatever, bhen ji ho sakte hai, bhabi lover and uh, wife nahi ho sakte, which is mm -hmm. also quite interesting to look at in terms of this male thing as Modi being this like single person going into some cave, uh, yogi, for instance, you know, mm -hmm. so, so there's a lot of interesting uh, stuff there. And I think these are questions that we should be asking rather than accepting them. And um, I think, yeah, so I, I think it's a great book and it, it should be made mandatory reading. Uh, maybe in, I mean, that's utopian, but uh, <laughs> I will probably tell in my newsroom to read. Uh, but I think in colleges as well, because I think emotions is something which is very complex. It's not just, I mean, I, I understand Shubham talked about this whole Marxist thing of looking at just the thing but i don't think the times are such i think we have to respond in innovative ways and i think this is, book is important because it gives us that trigger to kind of go ahead and ask and form a new narrative maybe but that's at a later stage first we need to learn to ask the right questions and not just uh, get dissuaded so thank you so much for writing the book and thank you so much everyone uh, to uh, for giving their time and thank you so much for inviting me um, I would like to uh, formally move ahead with the uh, vote of thanks. Uh, yeah. So as we come to end of today's discussion, I, Samriddhi Sharma, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, would like to propose the formal vote of thanks on behalf of IMPRI, Central for Human Dignity and Development, CHDD. I would like to thank all of you for attending today's deliberation, book discussion on politics, ethics, and emotions in New India. We are grateful for our chair, Ms. Chinki Sinhaji, our esteemed panelists, uh, Mr. Tushar Gandhi ji, uh, Dr. Hilal Hamad ji, uh, Mr. Shubham Sharma ji, and of, of course, Dr. Ajay, Ajay Gurawati ji, uh, for taking part in the discussion and enlightening us. We thank all our participants who have raised pertinent questions and actively participated in today's deliberation. We are grateful if you are watching us later on our YouTube channel or listening to us on our various podcasts or reading our publications. You may also find more book discussions and thematic events under IMPRI Web Policy Talk series. We hope you continue to join in future to our IMPRI Web Policy Talk. Uh, wishing you all a good evening and thank you. Okay, thanks also from my end for IMPRI, uh, Arjun and Samriddhi and of course, Chinki, Tushar, Shubham, and uh, uh, Hilal, was, and also Tanvir and other friends have joined. Thanks a lot and good night. Thanks, thanks. It's been a very Thank long you. session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Thank thanks. you so much. Sir. Thanks.